since there's the full spread. But I pressed a big blue button, which means that people can probably hear us talking right now, which is which is cool. Uh, hi. <laughs> I do have the uh, YouTube up. And, and yeah, this is it. It's it's clicking through. All I all it remains for me to do is is mash the we are live button on the on the Twitters, uh, which I'm going to do right now, which is which is good. Um, so there's now going to be some dead air. No, I'm, I'm joking. There's never dead air on this on this show. I I talk way too much. Uh, there we go. Perfect. Um, everyone, welcome, welcome to the welcome to the show. Most importantly, welcome John Morgan Christoph to the show. Uh, hello. hello, friend of the show. You've been watching this for for a long time. Uh, drip, dipping in and out of our other streams, as, uh, our my other yep. streams as well, and sort of uh, supporting with 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 various bits of interesting geological uh, knowledge. Well, we've we've been in touch on Twitter for longer than I've been seeing you making videos. I remember you were doing HS2 advocacy that oh showed up goodness. in my feed of transit people like, <laughs> years ago. Uh, yeah, that 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 is a, definitely a thing. Um, uh, there's sound. Oh, uh, Richard, you've lost the sound. Everyone, you should have the sound. The sound's coming through my end, everyone. Um, sounds, how's the sound balance, folks? Is it all good? We're, we're going to be crack, getting cracking momentarily. Uh, I promise. Right. Uh, in fact, you know, there's, there's nothing stopping us. We're, we're live and everyone's here. Um, do we get a NASA countdown today? I'm being asked. Oh, goodness. No, mm. no, 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 no. If, if you really want one, I can provide one. Yeah, but... we could. <laughs> yeah we could just count no because the thing is the format is is shaky at best if we start doing countdowns i'll press the wrong button and you know i don't have the training for this sort of uh, situation what i do have though is a an indication that spring is approaching which it doesn't necessarily feel like on your side of the pond but it feels pretty balmy over in europe because i don't know atmospheric science i'm gonna have a kombucha there we go oh well, it's 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 19 celsius here in arizona today oh that's not too bad yeah it it doesn't really get cold here is the thing. Ah uh, well yeah that's yeah but people in Texas say that so. Uh, oh yeah Texas got it bad. Yeah 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 quite spectacularly. Anyway we are gonna so before without further ado okay see what I mean about timekeeping we've already gone to hell without further ado um everything seems to be working technologically uh, we're talking about space shuttle rocket boosters I'm excited but before we do that John we're gonna talk about the news uh so there's there are only a few news items today um this evening the first so to all of our international um viewers of which there might be a fair few uh, today um hello welcome we're going to talk about uk things <laughs> no i promise there is a bit of an international uh, there's some international news content but the first thing is edinburgh's waverley station fantastic railway station um in terms of its chaos but chaos isn't a good thing for transport interchanges so i'm quite pleased that um mott mcdonald have been appointed as the uh, as the designer for the new the new master plan and they're going to do quite a lot of things to, to Waverley Station. There are some people getting upset because there's Waverley's quite famous for its big glass roof, right? Although I have to be have to be honest and admit that I've never quite got it because it's flat and not hugely interesting. But I think it's just in surface area people kind of like it because it looks old. Um, but for me, that's not a good enough excuse to 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 use the roof to stop expanding the stations. You kind of. As a, as a utility. Uh, so the plans are to do that, to improve it, to improve the way that people can move around the station, because at the moment it is hopeless from an accessibility and a passenger flow perspective. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to see that change. So that's cool. That's happening. Um, the next news thing... Uh, ah, yeah, this is more fun. This is more international. For anyone who's not sure um, and hasn't heard me ranting about Hyperloop, which um, is probably not that many of you anymore... Um, Hyperloop has, uh, it's the first proper paper I've seen that really digs into it. Um, it's from a, a, a chap, an engineer, an engineering lecturer and, and researcher from Delft, I think, from TU Delft. Um, and uh, and it's good. It's really good. It's quite short and snappy, actually. Uh, I should probably put a download link in the, in the description. Remind me to do that afterwards, uh, Rail Natter, Discord people. Um, but yeah, it's well worth a look. And its conclusion, it's got, you'll quite like the conclusion, John. Uh, it is that the overall objective of Hyperloop to offer an ultra-fast, safer, more economic and sustainable mode of public passenger transport, uh, dot, 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 um, is still very unclear, disputable, and requires much more independent and transparent research, which I think is a very polite way of summarising what is a pretty scathing summary of, of, of the, of the mm. system in the paper. It's quite good. Uh, this is, it, this... It, it, it funnily sounds very similar to some language in a 1993 GAO report that I will be citing later in this presentation. Ooh. Oh. But which is similarly intended to be scathing but polite. 
Yeah, I was going to say, because this, 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 this is like polite academic speak for it's not even a mode of transport. Stop talking about it. Mm-hmm. Um, which is which is nice. I like that. So yeah, Hyperloop remains a bunch of nonsense. Um, yeah. And it, as, the real I, question I think, Gareth, is: Is the space shuttle a gadget ban? <laughs> <laughs> oh damn it! I should have put the um, gadget ban alignment chart in. So <laughs> that was oh, a mistake. Boy. Yeah, yeah. Like whether we're where, whether I'm a gadget ban radical. Uh, I, 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 there's a lot of Discord chatter in the gadget ban channel about. <laughs> whether the space shuttle is a gadget ban uh i i don't think it is a gadget ban uh, i'm just putting it out there on a whim i don't mm. think it is a gadget ban uh it's i tend not, to agree I, I don't think a railway or indeed any kind of conventional transport could do the job that the the space shuttle and its replacements do um mm. what else oh yes um, so some nice views of some 3D rail string. This is what I see when I'm doing my day job, by the way. For anyone who's never seen what it looks like when I'm doing my day job, this is kind of it. This is These are the 3D rail strings for a former incarnation of Euston Station, which has now got the chop. Um, it's been, it, well, it's still not 100% confirmed, but um, Mark Thurston, who's the CEO of HS2 Limited, which is just a government agency that's a, a company for Britain reasons, um, uh, basically, he he said in in a in a conference that's ongoing at the moment um, that uh, that pla- that Houston's being descoped from eleven platforms to ten platforms, and then proceeded to try and say that that would mean that the scope that that it can still deliver the same number of trains that it was always supposed to, even though the original spec was for eighteen trains an hour, and uh, ten platforms means that it can only reliably deliver fourteen trains per hour. Um, that that to me seems like a major downscoping. Um, it's amazing that the, what the um, the reliability improvement you get from an additional resilience platform. In any case, that nice one extra platform you can see at the end there uh, that I've now run away from because this is just a video on loop um, is, is being chopped. It's it's gone, and the reason why it's being chopped um, is because oh, also while while this video is going, I'll just explain. There's De- there's Delta Junction, and we're about to look on a nice view of what Delta Junction looks like um, and will look like for trains coming out of Curzon Street. And then disappearing off up towards the East Midlands and Leeds. Look at this junction. This is this is P-Way at its fault. Look at this. Just done it. Oh, look at this. Anyway, right, that's that's enough of that. Um, the reason why uh, Euston is getting chopped is the same reason why people thought this was a good idea for Waterloo Bridge. How to make Waterloo Bridge pay. Um, this is just an eternal problem in Britain. Uh, possibly, well, in fact, definitely one in the US as well, right? Um, in fact, anywhere that be- that really deeply believes in neoliberalism over the power of the state, um, uh, which is that you have to make things pay for themselves uh, in the short term. Euston's being chopped because Lendlease wants wants more space to put larger foundations to put bigger buildings. Uh, so um, boo to Lendlease, they can go to hell, and uh, so can the people, the cowards who are um, within government who are saying that that's what we need to do and not just make the station work properly and get the value from having a proper transport interchange. Um, hashtag abolish the treasury. Anyway, there we go. There's um, that's that. Uh, someone shared this picture in the Discord, actually, and I really like it because it just summarizes these eternal problems we have in this country, this obsession with like being utterly obsessed with reducing capital costs to, no, to, to absolutely no value whatsoever. Anyway, there we are. Another common theme we'll be discussing later in the program. Hooray! <laughs> It turns out the neoliberalism idea is not very neo. Yeah, yeah, it's just like rehashed mercantilism. It's bad. It's bad, folks. It's bad. Um, anyway, uh, oh, but the happy news. Come on now, happy news. And yes, this uh, for me, like the, the ultimate kind of hybrid of of of, of mission oriented uh, capitalism. Uh, so what what good things we can pull out of capital? In fact, there's nothing good about it. basically the collaboration of people, independent of whether they have public or private as a label on their forehead, um, is achieving this, which is landing um, an electric multiple unit on Mars. Hooray! This is exciting. Perseverance landed, um, and yeah. it's space related, which is good because this is a space related rail natter. What what mm. what exciting things? What tidbits can you tell us that we might not have heard about this this one? Hmm. Well, so uh, I'm not working on Perseverance personally, but I know a couple people who do. And in fact, uh, the principal investigator for Mastcam Z, which is the the big uh, primary photography camera on the spacecraft, mm. is one of the people on my defense committee for my PhD. So oh, amazing. I've I've not been able to get in touch with him for about three weeks. <laughs> And probably yeah. won't for several more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll bet. Um, no, the, the the cool things about this is that um, so per- Percy is basically 
uh, not quite, but almost a copy of Curiosity Rover, which landed in 2012. Mm. Um, the, heart, the the bus for the spacecraft is literally the flight spare from Curiosity. Oh, really? Uh, oh, if yeah, it broke, it, don't They fix basically it. just had the chassis, the drivetrain, the um, main computers, all of the telemetry equipment sitting in a warehouse in JPL in Pasadena. And at some point, somebody in the U.S. government was like, hey, why don't we... Um, why don't we send that one too? <laughs> um, but the other thing that this is this is good for is that so the the way that NASA organizes its priorities for planetary exploration is through something called a decadal survey, and essentially how that works is that every ten years the planetary science community gets together and submits a bunch of ideas for what do we want to do for all the different levels of funding that NASA provides missions. Mm. And for the flagship category that Percy is in and that Curiosity was also in, the top priority from the previous decadal, uh, which is still current, is was a sample return from Mars. Um, so Percy doesn't get, doesn't get us quite there. It's going to essentially cache samples and then leave them at specific spots that a future rover could access mm. and yeah, then return yeah. to a, a rocket that comes back to Earth. Um, but what's also interesting is that the current pro the, the, the process for the next decadal survey is currently ongoing. So it will be interesting to see sort of how the priority changes for what do we define sample return as now that we have a rover that is specifically caching those samples to be returned. Ah, yeah, that's what you mean. Yeah. Ah. Um, for scale, cause people often think of these things as, as like, you know, the size of a, of a kitchen table, I think both Curiosity and and Percy are they're about the size of a mini, right? Like a yeah, they're like about a, a, a BMW the, mini. The huge. Yeah, we've got a one to one scale model of Curiosity in the lobby of the building where I work at Arizona State University, and it's in terms of its sort of X Y Z dimensions, it's about the same size as a mini, but it looks a little bit bigger because there's chassis is super low. And the also the pro like the, there's this big mass sticking at the top that makes the sort of highest point look a little bit higher up, sort of eye altitude wise. Ah, so yeah, yeah. It's it's a little bit more impressive in person, if anything. <laughs> oh, really? Okay, yeah. Uh, with, yeah, it's it's just really cool. And and they've got the little mm. helicopter, which I think is super cool as well, because the atmosphere yeah. is completely pathetic on Mars, which means that it, like the, it's really cool seeing them do the testing inside the. Mm -hmm. I presume they did the testing in the same place where the first Avengers film started being shot in. <laughs> Like the the big vacuum chamber thing, which I think is a JPL facility, right? You know, I I know that JPL has used a bunch of facilities for uh you know previous films. I have no I have no idea what they did for Avengers. I do know there's other vacuum facilities also because there's one at NASA Langley in Virginia, and there's one at NASA Ames, I think, up in um, Palo Alto in uh, the Bay Area. And both of those have also been used for various, you know, simulations and tests for entry, descent, and landing systems, both yeah, for yeah. Mars and elsewhere. Um, so it, I don't know specifically where they t where they tested the um, EDL hardware for Curiosity and Percy, but it's one of those places at any rate. Super cool. Anyway, we, space is very cool, and it's one of the things I've nerded about as long as I've as long as I've known that it existed. And so we could we could go off on one. And fun enough. That's exactly what the plan is. <laughs> so we're um yeah we're going to be talking about some we're going to be talking about space shuttle boosters. How you might be wondering this is a rail natter everyone. You might be thinking well why is that relevant? Well we'll explain that shortly. But first um we I suppose we ought to start the show. We're already fourteen minutes in and and we've not actually started. So without further ado um let's start the show. Welcome to tonight's rail natter everyone. <laughs> Lovely in city two two five fades out. Ah, lovely. Um, we flick to another picture of the uh, of the, the shuttle boosters for an idea of scale. I just I love this picture. In fact, let's go. Let's get both. We're going to get you up in the corner, John. Hi, we've seen you for Hello. the first time. You've been excluded from our screens for fifteen minutes. It's not it's not acceptable. Um, and we're going to get you big in in a matter of seconds. But uh, this, I just thought I'd, I'd dwell on this picture for a bit because it's kind of awesome. Um, 
Uh, and it's relevant to see the scale of it compared to people, I think. Uh, and in fact, mm -hmm. you use this picture later anyway, so we're going to see it again shortly, right? Yep. Um, so, um, so that picture is nice. But before we do that, John, um, I've got you down. You're here as a space and transit nerd because uh, that was what you'd self-confessed as being and it felt appropriate. Um, tell us about yourself. Tell us, tell so, us about yourself and, and, and tell us some things. Yeah, sure. So... Um... My, my day job is I'm a PhD candidate at Arizona State University in Tempe, Arizona, in the School of Earth and Space Exploration. Um, the exact nature of the program is it's half planetary science and half spacecraft engineering. So you wind up necessarily needing to have that disciplinary nexus of both knowing what the spacecraft is supposed to do and then knowing what it actually can do and then making those things be the same thing, which is sometimes tricky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but then as my sort of my sort of side hustle, uh, you know, I've been active, like doing transportation politics for a long time. And I'm currently serving on a, the, uh, over transportation oversight commission for a local municipality, basically making sure that, you know, whenever they modify a bus route or propose a light rail schedule change, somebody who knows a thing or two about how trains and buses work has seen it and says, okay, that makes sense. Um, but so the, the main reason why I sort of why Gareth and I decided to do this was that like there's this meme of this of the shuttle boosters but there's actually like there's a whole story of the logistics system of the space shuttle program which is you know one of these sort of class examples of weirdly niche intermodal transportation similar to like how when Dr. David Turner was on previously talking about quail or beer it's of the same <laughs> magnitude as that so yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's it's um and 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 that's kind of why I love these episodes, these sorts of episodes that that have um the kind of yeah the 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 cross section of different disciplines and how things you know nothing is straightforward and linear, and that's what makes them interesting. Mm -hmm. It's the interconnectivity that that makes it fun. Um, the first so there is some I'm going to now alt tabs us to something, and we're going to go yes. guest face, and we're going to so there uh, that's a hint as to what we're about to talk about. But before we do that, we're going to go to uh, native dash land dot ca. And you wanted to just you wanted to start us off on a theme on a really important subject before we kicked mm. off, didn't you? Yeah. So this is so we're doing a land acknowledgement here. So uh, I'm currently broadcasting from Tempe, Arizona, which is uh, in the uh, ancestral homelands of, uh, according to ASU, uh, my you know the place the place I study and am employed by, uh, over twenty indigenous people groups, most notably for you know. The current epoch of colonialism, the uh, Akimel Adam and the Piposh peoples, and then over the course of our presentation today, we're going to be talking about a supply chain that basically covers the entire U.S. But the specific segment that the booster, the shuttle boosters transmit between uh, northern Utah and central Florida, uh, the two ends of that are covered by the one you just moused over, Gareth, the Goshute. Yep. And uh, there are some other uh, Shoshone-speaking peoples in the same area. And then over in Florida, there's three that I want to highlight. First of all, the ICE, which was the chiefdom that was in place at Cape Canaveral itself at the time of European contact. Uh, then secondly, the Timucua tribes in northern and central Florida. Uh, the last few hundred of whom were forcibly relocated to Cuba by the Spanish in 1763. And then finally, and this is one that some of you may recognize as the Seminole, who were one of the five nations that were forcibly relocated in 1830 to what we now call Oklahoma during the Trail of Tears under the administration of President Andrew Jackson. So the reason why I would sort of want to point this out here is that it's worth reminding ourselves that not just, you know, railroads and transportation systems in general, but the military industrial complex that birthed the United States' space program was directly involved in the, you know, colonialism of North America and the subjugation, enslavement, forced relocation, and ultimately genocide of the peoples that lived here. And it's important to remember that because, so we need to be moving away from settler colonialist paradigms as we're building infrastructure, and especially for things like thinking about humanity's presence in space, a settler colonialist paradigm under which we can take as much land as we want and exploit it without consequence for what's there is simply not going to lead us to good outcomes. Uh, 
settler colonialism has caused harm not just to the colonized peoples of North America, but also to the land that the colonizers then have to inhabit later. So we need to ensure this doesn't continue. And it's worth sort of pointing out explicitly anytime we're talking about North American uh, systems of transportation infrastructure or military industrial development. And it's and it's you just look at the complexity and the the cultures and the Mm -hmm. and the history that that's just been dominated and and largely erased by uh largely european settlement right it's just Mm -hmm. frightening absolutely frightening i will end this on a positive note though which is that at least in the united states native nations are sovereign entities they are a level of the united states government alongside states counties and municipalities and they have legal rights and treaty obligations with the united states government and with other sort of lower levels of government Mm. The problem is that the United States has a really bad track record of actually following those obligations. Um, Just within the last month or so, there's been a couple of landmark Supreme Court rulings on things like, uh, you know, when do the native tribes have jurisdiction in certain kinds of criminal cases? And that's a fight that's been going on for a long time, and it's not going to end soon, but we are at least moving in the direction of you know, making some progress. But there are still, like, the land exploitation thing is absolutely still going on, and we need to stop it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and if you've heard about Resolution Copper here in Arizona or the Dakota Access Pipeline in North Dakota and South Dakota or, uh, you know, Bears Ears National Monument, it's not a national monument anymore because of the Trump administration or something like that, I don't remember exactly. Um, it's not like this is a historic issue. This is something that we still need to work on. And we still need to get better at, and we still need to keep fighting for. Absolutely, it's, it's absolutely contemporary. This, um, yeah, this uh, this this website's fantastic. I, I mean, the the um, I was going to say the nearest native uh, subjugated native people I'm aware of to us in Britain are the Sami, and I was very pleased to whiz over here and see that the Sami are, actually do have they have a they are represented on here, which is really interesting. So, um, yeah, um, this website's fantastic, really interesting, and it, you're showing known groups across South America. Um, indigenous people in mm-hmm. in Australia and New Zealand, yeah, really interesting. Um, so yeah, thanks thanks for linking thank, and and kind of yeah, I, I, it's I think we it, it's too easy for transport to be disassociated with its 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 past, its history, and, and its contemporary legacy as well. Um, and, yep. and frankly, to to get the best transportation system, you need to be thinking about making sure that you're you're serving everyone uh, equally and and impacting on everyone equally you know distributing the negative impacts equally uh, uh and not not kind of basically uh embedding existing prejudices even further um so yeah thanks for that uh i i we are I, I feel trivial that i'm now going to ping over to a, 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 an orange screen that says a horse's arse of a tail um but uh that is unfortunately the way that the format works we fly all over the place and that's precisely what's happening we're about to talk about the the, the whole reason for this rail matter is um, this thread, or rather it's not a thread, it appeared as a Twitter thread on the day that I was moving house into this place, um, which was really annoying because it's the first time that Permanent Way went went viral in a massive way. Um, so that was um, that was annoying because it meant that I couldn't respond and, and tell everyone they were speaking absolute nonsense. So I thought I'd um, move past this uh, series of bad puns and very quickly go through this thread. Um, so let's do that. Uh, and I'll try to go. So for people who are on here who are who are space people uh, and not necessarily or, or, or not necessarily railway people, I'll try and explain this quickly, but also in a way that kind of makes sense. So um, so this is the thread and it's based it, this. This thread is just an absolute copy paste from an old email chain that was being sent around in the 90s. Right. This is this is old nonsense, old uh, uh, rinse and repeat nonsense. So um, I'm going to go through and, and do some. Uh, pings and buzzes because people often say they miss pings and buzzes thanks for putting the link in the chat by the way john that's great um and we'll put it in the the description as well for everyone uh, there so first of all uh the the statement this this whole thing is about um so people listening in audio only i don't know if i am going to read through this whole thing um but i'm going to point out just some key points through the thread you can find it quite easy with a google i think um, so it's, it's 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 trying to tie a history lesson together. It's trying to tie several entirely dis well not necessarily disconnected but kind of plausible sounding truths 
and turn them into a, a single thread of truth that just doesn't exist. And it, it's a bit, we talked earlier about the fact that history or, or themes are rarely linear. They're normally a complicated network of things, right? This is certainly one of those examples. So the thing that I've just pinged as being true is that the US standard railroad gauge um, is indeed four foot eight and a half inches. That is true. And unfortunately, in terms of truths and falsehoods, uh, it goes downhill from there. Um, standard gauge is at four foot eight and a half inches. I suppose you could call this a kind of a half truth because there's a lot of railway in the US that isn't to this gauge, just as it's true in the UK, there's a lot of railway that isn't to this gauge. But standard gauge is four foot eight and a half inches, 1.435 meters. I'll give them that. Um, as I say, it's downhill from there. So then, so the next thing that gets pointed out, uh, which I've just buzzed, um, is that um, the, the <laughs> these railroads were built this way in, uh, in England and so English engineers designed the first US railroads. Well, a lot of that is not correct. Um, I'm ignoring the English-British thing because uh, lots of people who built railroads, in fact, most people who built railroads were, were Irish, followed by the Welsh, followed by lots of people from other parts of the world. Um, but uh, <laughs> track gauge was also all over the place. before the, rail the, the railways were being established in the US long before the gauge question had been answered um, in, in the UK. So, so that's nonsense. <laughs> Um, next up, uh, this continued idea that the first railway lines were built by the same people who built the first wagon tramways, and that's the gauge they used. Again, this is nonsense because um, lots and lots of gauges were being used across the whole of the UK, so that's not true. Um, and also, uh, yeah, I forget how many layers of wrong this thread. It's, well, it's, it's stressing me out already, John, like how many layers of just misinterpreted history this thing covers. Oh, my goodness. The next buzz is saying that the people who built the tramways, this is really hilarious, used the same jigs and tools that they had used for building wagons, which used the same wheel spacing. Again, there are so many layers of incorrect here. Um, but, like, there were dozens of different gauges in use because there were dozens of different mines, different industrial operations that used tramways. Um, and the fact, the idea they used... Uh, oh, my goodness. So that's wrong as well. Uh, what else have we got? Oh, there's another so buzz. If you're... Oh, if you're on. making a spacecraft and you use the same tooling, you better be operating a high heritage system. <laughs> and if you're using the exact same instrument over again, you're probably not doing a good enough job building instruments. <laughs> uh, this it gets even funnier at this point because this th this idea that um, why why did the wagons have a particular we odd wheel spacing? Um, well, if they tried to use any other spacing, the wagon wheels would break on some of the old long distance roads in England. This is just utter nonsense uh, uh no nonsense wagon wheels would be going along sloshy muddy paths and tracks in britain independent of and, and made by any old muggins with any width for a long time and that's just it's just very very silly uh that's the next buzz imperial rome built the first long distance roads in europe that's incorrect there have been very very ancient um long distance paths and tracks and roads manufactured you know, engineered roads um thousands of years before the Romans came on the scene. Like, the ancient Greeks were the first people to do permanent way, for goodness sake. Like, paved roads are a lot older than the Romans. Just do lally. Um, what else? Oh, yeah, there's also, like, the pixel, the, the, the kind of the pixel rationing of, of Bill's pictures really winds me up as well. Um, it's just a bad thread. And also, don't split your threads in the middle of sentences, folks. Come on now. Uh, what's the next buzz? Oh yeah, Roman war chariots. They don't exist, folks. They 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 didn't don't exist. There were never Roman war chariots. That's just made up. That's just made up. Um, so that so this is suggesting that they are the things that caused the ruts in the road. That what's the next buzz? Um, you're missing all the buzzes, John, because you don't get the audio through, do you? Um, so this is the suggestion that the, the U.S. railroad gauge is derived from the original specifications for an impor, imperial Roman war chariot. Just wrong on, uh, like at least 20 different levels um what's next oh yeah here we go so now we're talking about the, the imperial army roman chariots again uh and they were made just wide enough to accommodate the rear ends of two war horses nope no why, why would why would that be a thing horses have different sized bottoms for stars um oh my goodness so that's just so many layers of wrong now we've got a picture of a space shuttle so we're getting onto the juicy bit right um oh yeah this is a bit of a mean false because uh, it's saying that the, this is this is showing how old the thing is because this thread was written um, pretty recently uh, and SRBs were not being made by Thiokol because they're not called Thiokol anymore. Um, so this is this was me being a bit mean, mm. but it's definitely still a false because it's not Thiokol that makes them anymore and there's no space well, shuttle. We will talk about uh, exactly what happened to Thiokol. Oh, yes, please. 
Yes, please. Um, what's the next buzz? This is the suggestion. Right, okay. This is the suggestion that um, in any way that... <laughs> like, basically, the, the engineers who designed... This is me quoting rabbit ears now. The engineers who designed the solid rocket boosters would have preferred to make them a bit fatter, but they had to be shipped by train from the factory to the launch site. The railroad line from the factory <laughs> happens to run through a tunnel in the mountains, and the SRBs had to fit through that tunnel. Right. Uh, I've no doubt, John, you're going to unpick this on a number of levels, but the immediate thing that came to my head is if the SRBs needed, to, like, weren't going to be able to deliver what they needed to do to get the shuttle into orbit, you'd have got them from somewhere else because ultimately the point is you're getting a thing into orbit. That, that, anyway, right, you're going to unpick this in greater detail, I'm sure, but for me, that's why there's a yep. picture of a shuttle going back down again and people saying, uh oh. Um, anyway, right, there's another buzz which is. Um, saying that the tunnel is slightly wider than the railroad track. This is like the fun... From a track perspective, this is the fundamental problem with this whole thread. The whole thing is built around the idea that track gauge and loading gauge are the same thing, which I think I show in the next picture, which I do. Yes, hooray. Um, track gauge is the distance between the two running rails. Loading gauge is the space within which you can run trains. Um, as evidenced by the fact that both the US and the UK have the same track gauge, loading gauge is totally separate from track gauge only tenuously connected to track gauge um the reality is that you can have a massive loading gauge as they do as you do in lots of parts of the us you know double stacked containers with exactly the same track gauge um so this is just a, a, a london underground which is the pic the kind of the silhouette picture there which is tiny 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 little loading gauge is also standard gauge track so mm -hmm. the two are unconnected which is why you want to you want to know the real kicker gareth oh yeah go on if you look at an American Association of Railroads loading gauge plate, the most common, there, there's several different ones. The most common are plates B and C. Mm. The width that is allowed under plates B and C is 10 foot 8 inches. And you'll notice if you go up to the even like the double stack ones like plate H, it's also 10 foot 8 inches. You will also probably note by just a quick Wikipedia search that the shuttle boosters are wider than 10 feet 8 inches. <laughs> <laughs> they exceed U.S. loading gauge if you strictly follow the plate, but that's because that's not what the plate is meant for. The plate gives you the loading gauge acceptable on a 475-foot radius curve. Hmm. It says nothing about track that is straight. It yep. says nothing about overbridges or tunnels. It says nothing about uh, the dimensions clearance within that gauge that you can have depending upon the length of your cargo. So they just go around all the things that would obstruct a booster. Yeah, it's, it's just, uh, which is, which now I'm getting excited because we're talking about gauging, which is obviously that's like my, half my day job is gauging. In any case, that's, so that's annoying. We're going to get another buzz, which is, um, there's another horse's arse joke inbound. Uh, yeah, so the, the basically this is the last thing, which is the, the overall suggestion of this thread and this email chain and whatever else it was, it's been copied and pasted as, is that a major, rabbit ears again, a major space shuttle design feature of what is arguably the world's most advanced transportation system was determined over 2,000 years ago by the width of a horse's ass. Uh, no, it, it was not. You can chalk up another one on the falsehoods for arguably the world's most advanced transportation system. Mm. <laughs> ah, okay. Well, yeah. yeah. It, 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 it's it's a complicated machine, and we don't have time to get in exactly how, but there's a pair of really good books. Uh, T.A. Heppenheimer's History of the Space Shuttle Development Program, Volumes 1 and 2. Ah, nice. Yeah, yeah. Which are excellent primary source literature for anybody who is interested in learning more offline. Nice. There we go. So what we're so that was the so what? How long have I taken? I've taken quarter of an hour over that. I'm so well. No, actually, we did some chat. I probably took about eight minutes. I feel okay. Yeah, we're we're okay. Fine. We're doing fine time wise. So let's go back to guest face. But this is what John. This is why you're here, which is to tell us what is the backstory. And for anyone who's in audio only, um, I've put the word side in brackets between back and story to say backside story. It's another horse's arse pun. I'm so sorry, everyone. I can only apologize. I couldn't help it. Um, incidentally, folks, we are going to look at track gauge in a future rail natter. So where track gauge actually came from is to come in another future rail natter. So we're not going to talk about track gauge much here. John might talk about it a bit, but that's not the main theme of this. But we're going to talk... You know more about track gauge than I do, Gareth. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get obsessive over that in a future episode. There's there's plenty to unpick, and it's quite a fun story. So we'll do that in a few, in future times. But what is the backside story? Well... I'm going to press the next image, and we're going to go into image slides, and John's going to tell us things. So let's all yeah. describe what we can see, and, and here we go. It's happening. 
Yeah, so audio description, we got five images on the screen here. Uh, I tried to make a little space in the top corner for, you know, our, our faces. Our, yeah. Uh, I don't know how well that's going to work, though. We'll see. We'll see. Anyway, so um, there's a variety of different rockets uh, on the screen here. And uh, sort, of, I'll, sort of a couple terminology notes here. So when we think about space hardware, uh, rocket usually is something we reserve for the thing that spits hot exhaust gas out the back to make thrust. But what you're seeing here is a collection of launch vehicles, uh, which describes not just the propulsive element, but also the f propellant storage system, the avionics, the thrust vectoring, the telemetry systems, the aerodynamic profile of the vehicle, um, the, the complete flight system, as it were, for the thing that gets you from Earth to space is called the launch vehicle. Um, and there are, are several examples here. So uh, as is noted in the chat right now, there's an N1 from the say, uh, yeah. <laughs> Soviet space program in the bottom. I spotted the N1, uh, which is left. down here. I'm going to do it. The, the red won't come up very clearly, but I'm, I am scribbling yep. in red. There is the N1. Mm -hmm. And then immediately next to it, bottom center is an R7. Uh, I believe that one is either a Soyuz U, a Soyuz FG, or a Soyuz 2-1A. I do not have the ability to tell the difference between them solely based on the exhaust ports of yeah. the engines. <laughs> I am. Um, this um, is where I really need. I really am regretting not having Alice's uh, Soviet anthem drop because oh mm. my goodness, that <laughs> that would make this better. Anyway, yes. Yeah, so, well, it's funny you mentioned that because also up above that image is of the Soyuz is a um, Antonov AN-124 transport aircraft with a US built Centaur upper stage being unloaded from it in the front. Um, so the, the purpose <laughs> here for this slide is basically sort of like, let's talk about how do we get space hardware from the place where it's built to the manufacturing, to the launch site. Mm. Uh, and on the one hand, that depends on your political economy, right? Like the Soviets and the Russians are still mostly using rail to transport almost every piece of space hardware they have that can't go by road because, you know, Russian roads being, you know, ha having the reputation they do for being poorly maintained. Um, but also just because of, you know, the relative political economy of rail versus air transport. In the United States and in uh, Europe and Japan and also I think China to some extent, um, that political economy gets a little bit switched. And space hardware really falls under the same problem that high value cargo for air freight does if you try and transport it by rail. Uh, you need to keep it secure and you need to keep it in a stable environment. And you also need to get it from the place where it's manufactured to the place where it's gonna be used very quickly. Yeah. So most US space hardware today is transported by airlift. Some of it's transported by trucking on the interstates. Um, but like, as you can see with that Antonov carrying a Centaur, we would absolutely be using uh, you know, Soviet designed and built aircraft to transport our launch vehicle systems. The mm -hmm. exception to that historically has been solid rocket boosters. And the basic distinction, sorry, it's important to talk about here, like what is the difference between a solid rocket booster and other kinds of rockets? So that's why I put the picture of the Titan launch vehicles down in the bottom right corner, which you've put a nice little yikes in front of. Um, <laughs> or sorry, a, a launch vehicles label. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I briefly had this, uh, the, this, a small Skype pop-up screen in front of there anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah, so these are all different variants of the Titan launch system, which is derived from the Titan intercontinental ballistic missile, which was one of the early US Air Force uh, ballistic missile systems for inter intercontinental nuclear weapons develop, develop, delivery. Um, and you'll notice that the thing that these five launch vehicles all have in common is that they're this core stage at the bottom in, in the center on each of them and that is basically unchanged. Uh, the left two are Titan II variants. Uh, one is the Titan II Gemini configuration that launched the Gemini astronauts. And number two is the Titan Agena configuration, which launched a lot of US's robotic spacecraft, both for Earth orbiting and for interplanetary missions. Mm. And for the Titan III, the only change to the core stage was they made it a little bit longer. But then they've also added these other things on the sides, these booster rockets. So in terms of like, what is the actual difference here? 
a liquid rocket is using a propellant that is in a liquid form and is flowing into a combustion chamber through some plumbing. Gets If it's a monopropellant, then it just burns in the combustion chamber. If it's a bipropellant or multipropellant, you have to mix the fuel and oxidizer at exactly the right ratio. And as that mixture combusts, it gets exhausted through a nozzle. A solid rocket motor does the ba basically the same thing, except that there is no flow except in the gaseous phase. The propellant storage area and the combustion chamber are the same thing. And you basically cast the propellant on the inside of the combustion chamber in place, almost like a candle. And most solid propellants these days are plasticky, so you can do that pretty easily. In terms of why do you care, uh, most of the time what you use solid rocket motors for is when you need to have a rocket ready to go and it, can, it has to sit in a place for a long time with its payload attached and just wait for a signal to go. There is basically exactly one use case where that's appropriate, and that's a ballistic missile. Um, but mm. the other nice thing about solid rocket motors is that they have very high thrust to weight ratios. So if you have an existing liquid propelled launch vehicle to get stuff into orbit, and you want to have it launch heavier or bulkier things, you can stick some solid rocket boosters on the sides and give it extra thrust at liftoff so it can actually get off the pad. Um, which anyone, which anyone who's played Kerbal Space Program knows, you just blast, stick a couple of solid rocket boosters on there, and and, and happy days, right? Exactly, exactly. Um, the trick is though, because the solid motor is cast with the propellant already in place, uh, it's very heavy and it's very dense, and you don't really have the ability to transport it by aircraft because it's too heavy. Uh, something to note about that Centaur that's up there in the picture note with the Antonov is the Centaur is basically an aluminum balloon with some rocket engines attached to the back. It literally cannot support itself structurally unless there is propellant loaded into its tanks. There's been some newer versions which have modified that to, you know, make it stable outside of a propellant loaded environment. But for most of the history of this upper stage, which was used since the 1950s and 60s, it's been a balloon tank system. Um, because of that, it's very lightweight. You can easily put it on an aircraft, and it can just go wherever you need it to go. But you can't really do that with a solid. So on the next image, we're going to talk about some solids and how they get places. Cool. Which So, yeah, I, I was going to say that the um, I was reading – in fact, what did I get? I got a his, some history of the Apollo – so um, of the uh, the uh, uh, Saturn V, actually, the Saturn uh, – kind of the Saturn family of, of – um, of of launch vehicles and um mm -hmm. yeah li reading about their the battle for weight limitation and and on on basically making this thing just strong enough to su self support mm -hmm. and, and <laughs> so it's barely enough so that it didn't just buckle in on its own of its own mass and and uh, yeah it's, it's really interesting really really interesting yeah um, yeah the other thing so and not so just support itself on the pad but support itself under thrust because it's going to be pulling you know initially maybe one and a half to two G's off the pad for the shuttle, a lot less than that for the Saturn V. But the more propellant mass you have relative to your payload, the higher the G is going to be when you are approaching propellant burnout. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's got to be able to support its weight, not just under one G, but under, uh, in the shuttle's case, like two and a half G. Uh, on a SpaceX Falcon 9, like three or four is, it, um, is that is that point where you get max because you've got maximum atmospheric, atmospheric density, which is essentially like pushing the top. It's like mm -hmm. a hand on one end of the vehicle, and then you've got the thrust, which is the hand on the other end of the vehicle, and the two of them kind of pushing each other. Is that max Q? Mm -hmm. Is that the so? Name? Max Q involves the aerodynamic stresses, so that happens very early in the launch. Um, okay, yeah. It, you basically just you do not want to have so much drag that you rip the fairing off the spacecraft or rip the aerodynamic components off the launch vehicle. Um, and is that Once you, is that a balance of like you've got the most thrust quite early on combined with the most thick atmosphere? So is it that kind of combination of? Yeah, you, there's a there's a delicate balancing act of, and this is where I'm not a launch vehicle engineer. I work on the payload side of the industry, so you know you could probably find some rocket engineer, rocket scientist who actually ro builds rockets to talk about this more. But there's this delicate balancing act in the ascent profile of how much drag is on the vehicle versus how much thrust you're giving it versus how much thrust to weight ratio. And then you want to minimize the time so that it's close as closely maximizes a theoretical instantaneous burn as possible, but that's you know physically impossible. So you have to do approximations, et cetera. It's just there's a lot of math. 
rocket science everyone it's <laughs> it's good fun and yeah you get it's amazing how much you learn playing kerbal space program i mean obviously not the the real science underneath it but mm -hmm. all like in terms of the first step of fundamental principles i've learned so much from ksp anyway yeah. um next set of images i mean immediately i have to comment on the nasa liveried uh diesel loco that is that mm -hmm. is one of the coolest liveries i've ever seen a locomotive in yeah, so that is an Alco S2. It is one of Alco, two Alco S2s that, the Na that NASA purchased at the beginning of the Apollo program right after uh, Kennedy Space Center was inaugurated, basically to build the Space Center. So this is sort of talking about the NASA railroad, right? So the, the original rail transportation system at the Cape was built mostly to construct the spaceport, the, the launch complex itself, rather than to support the launches. It did have both roles um, eventually. Like you can see there's a, uh, there's a map of the track in its current configuration from Open Rail Map, uh, open rail map uh, where Gareth is drawing the you know, little track lines there. <laughs> um, in the inset, there's a picture from NASA's History Office archive, which is showing some of the workers installing the tracks leading into, uh, I don't know if that's the RPSF or the VAB or... Which oh, one of the buildings on the center VAB it is. being the big, the big tall one with the massive NASA logo on it, the vertical assembly yeah, building, we'll, right? We'll get into a more detailed talk about where the tracks actually go and serve later. But ah, cool. what you can notice is that there's this orange line off on the right side of, or the left side of the map through Titusville. That's the Florida East Coast Railroad's main line, which runs from Jacksonville in the north to Miami in the south. And this is about halfway along that line. Uh, there's a junction uh, up there at the sort of Indian River estuary called Mims Junction. And from there, the line crosses the Indian River and uh, there's two branches, right? So the first branch goes down south towards the uh, vehicle assembly building and the um, NASA industrial facility. Uh, and then there's the western branch, sort of eastern branch, which uh, goes to the launch sites themselves. And there's also another branch that goes further down to another launch site that is Cape Canaveral Air Force Station Site 40, which at the time of the NASA program was just being built and was for the Titan III boosters that we saw on the previous slide. So hmm. the is that railroad this, was... This bit here. Yeah, that little branch section right there. And you can see actually just above where you've drawn that circle, there is a little interchange yard where the NASA train crews would uh, drop off the... Uh, cargo bound for that pad and then an air force crew in a different shunting locomotive would take those you know freight cars over to the titan assembly area and the launch pads um yeah. and so actually so while we're here actually the the, the cargo that you're seeing at the top uh, right of the screen those two big drums those are some of the first solid rocket boosters transported by rail and those are titan three uh rocket boosters ah, okay um and then later on, when the Air Force upgraded it to the Titan IV, they transported them in a very similar way. But you'll notice a couple of things, right? One is that they are not built to fit U.S. loading gauge. They're much smaller. <laughs> and that's yeah. because the requirement for these boosters was set by the payload need for the Titan III rocket, not by anything related to you know, the railroads having a certain loading gauge or whatever. Um, you also notice there are these sort of blue trapezoid-shaped boxes on the front and back of each of these cars. And those are actually air conditioning units that are keeping the interior of the boosters segments, uh, A, clean with the filtration unit, B, uh, low on humidity, and C, not make, uh, make sure they don't overheat. Uh, because inside those boosters, repellents already mixed. And you've got both the fuel and the oxidizer already in place. Now, it's very hard to light a solid rocket motor. It's not like a candle where you just light a Zippo and then it <laughs> sort of starts to burn. <laughs> goes, um, yeah. you, you have to have a set of very complex pyrotechnics to actually get this thing to burn. But it will burn very spectacularly if it does. Yeah. You don't want to so be, you, you don't have be poking that there. there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. If it goes, it goes big. Yep. Pretty much. Um, so this was actually one of the regular cargoes that the NASA Railroad handled, uh, not just during the Apollo program, but after the Apollo program. Um, but at its peak in the sort of early 60s, uh, this railroad was transporting basically everything, right? Hmm. Um, 
you know, the Florida East Coast would bring stuff into the interchange at MIMS, and then these two little S2 switchers would bring it into where it was needed at the Cape. They brought in the concrete to build pad 39A and B, which were originally for the Saturn launch vehicles for Apollo, and they were later repurposed for the shuttle. They brought in all of the gravel that was used to build the crawler way that connects the vehicle assembly building with yeah. those two launch pads. They brought in granite from uh, the Tennessee Valley Authority on some kind of uh, dam excavation project, specifically because they would need something that would not erode very easily hmm. during hurricanes. Because this is, you know, this is smack dab in the middle of hurricane, uh, you know, a hurricane zone for Florida. Um, they have also brought in like the steel that was used to build the physical buildings of the VAB, the NASA industrial facilities, uh, the later the, the the rotation processing facility for the shuttle boosters. Um, and then one of the more interesting things is that they also brought in some shipments of basalt rock and sand from uh, the California deserts and from northern Arizona because they wanted to have a training yard at the center where the astronauts who are going to go to the moon and use all of the science experiments they brought with and drive the rovers around uh, would have the opportunity to test on something that resembled the lunar surface. Yeah, okay. So they yeah. literally had train cars from the Santa Fe pulling in, you know, gravel and basalt rocks and sand from Arizona to build a, a literal moonscape. It's, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, absolutely yeah. amazing. I, mean, I, just, I see you've highlighted the, the Space Force station. Yeah, we, someone there. pointed out in the chat. Where was it? Someone was pointing out in the chat that um, that they could see that it said uh, Space Force. Yeah, Tim. Tim mm -hmm. Bowen. It says Space Force Station. Yeah, I have to laugh yep. at that. I'm also noticing in the chat, uh, there's a couple of things about, is there an Air Force train too? We'll get to that in a bit. Um, but yes, there was a separate loco a locomotive kept at uh, CCAFS, uh, the the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station at the Titan complex specifically for handling and receiving the Titan boosters, but they did not take those booster shipments all the way from the interchange at MIMS. Uh, um, I'm also noticing the, uh, the, the, uh, the question up here, like what do the other letters stand for besides VAB for vehicle assembly building? Uh, sorry, friends, there are a lot of initialisms and acronyms. Uh, if I slip on one, please do let me know. Um, I've been trying to catch you wherever I've noticed you do. I've trying to I've been trying to catch you, so we, we should be fine. And people mm -hmm. can Google it. There's Google. You've all got Google. Yeah. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can Google it. Come on now. Yeah, uh, we it's... we will eventually cover every all of the initialisms and news here. <laughs> yeah. Um, right. Shall we? Um, shall we? This is such an awesome image, and I don't want to lose that um, that NASA livery look. I just love it so much. Yeah. But so shall we... you can you can still see that locomotive. It is preserved at <gasps> the. Um, oh. Uh, Gold Coast Space Museum in uh, sorry Rail Museum in Florida, which is not too far from the from the Space Center. Perfect. So that I mean, this is a place that I want to visit more. It's like up there in my top three of places I want to go in the U.S. Uh, I think. And um, mm. if that's if there's a railroad museum nearby, hello. Uh, right. Well, the, the, the other thing to note, sorry, this is also this is oh, yeah. the Florida East Coast is the same railroad that's building the Bright Line high yeah, speed yeah. system, um, and they're going to have a station eventually at Coco, which is the town south of Titusville, um, which is closest to, uh, to the Port Canaveral area itself. So eventually you will be able to take a train to visit the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, who knows when it'll be complete, though? Yeah. Oh, man, that is, that is pretty awesome. I want that. Yeah. Catch. Yeah. Get, get the Amtrak down and then, and then bright line through. Perfect. Yeah. So anyway, um, yeah, we, we, we are just conscious we should we should move into the next image. Yeah, so so this so having covered what sort of what the NASA railroad was built for, right? Uh, basically, after a, as the Apollo program was winding down, the U.S. government had to make a decision about where to go next, and the sort of the consensus emerged that you know rather than trying to leverage Apollo to have a sustained permanent U.S. moon base or you know do some kind of human Mars mission, they want they want they decided they wanted to do a reusable vehicle that could make the cost of getting to space cheaper to enable more missions in future. Um, and they basically had this process from, you know, even as the Apollo program was winding down in about 1971 to 72, through the early 80s of transitioning the space center from launching these big Saturn V moon rockets to launching the shuttles. Mm. But as that process was occurring, the design of the shuttle was also evolving. So you see here in the top left, there is a diagram which shows three different uh, launch vehicle configurations drawn in some very rudimentary sort of 
pen and paper sketch kind of thing. Um, this sort of illustrates a process that occurred between NASA and the Office of Management and Budget, which is a um, executive office in Washington that basically their job is to make the budget for the executive branch every year. And at the time the shuttle was being cons was being developed, there was this initial idea that the most economical thing would be to reuse the entire system. And that would mean having a space plane that could either take itself to orbit as a single stage or have a two stage space plane where you've got one big aircraft that can get you up to high altitude in like Mach 5 or something. And then it drops off another smaller aircraft which then rockets itself all the way to space. Yeah. So one of the issues that, that ran into was that you could minimize the per flight operational costs of the shuttle with that approach, which was all, which was what the shuttle was supposed to be from the outset, but it had this massively high development cost because ah. it involved a whole bunch of new aeronautical and uh, rocket engineering that was not in use for the Apollo program or NASA's other parallel programs that were going on during Apollo. So the OMB basically forced NASA to de-scope the way that the shuttle was designed so that you could have the highest per flight cost possible with a reusable vehicle on the operations budget while minimizing the capital budget required to develop the vehicle in the first place. So you can see we, we, we progress from this two-staged winged vehicle with both pieces, with both stages being able to return onto a runway landing to this middle thing where you've got the shuttle at the top with an orbiting winged vehicle with an external fuel tank attached, like a World War II drop tank. Yeah. And then it's sitting on top of a Saturn V stage. I was going to say, it looks Saturn v to me, that thing underneath. Mm -hmm. the they, they were... Con for a good while, they were considering reusing the Saturn V first stage to be the first stage of the space shuttle. Mm. And that got dropped for the exact same reason. You could have even lower development uh, costs and higher operational costs by building a new set of side boosters. So this final configuration is something called TEOS, uh, which I don't remember what the acronym stands for. I would need to look it up in the in Heppenheimer real quick. Um, TEOS. Get Googling, everyone. Can you beat John in the book? <laughs> I vaguely remember which page it's on. I just need to make sure. I mean, I, I can also it. Google it. Yes, so TEOS stood for Thrust Assisted Orbiter Shuttle. And basically what that means in everyday person speak is the shuttle has a set, the orbiter has a set of rocket engines on it that will start at the ground and light and get it all the way to orbit, but they don't have enough thrust to be able to propel the vehicle off the pad. Mm -hmm. So you need some side boosters attached to the external tank to be able to get the thing off the pad because it's so big. That was the decision that NASA ultimately was forced into by GAO, and immediately they ran into another decision of, okay, are we going to use a liquid rocket or a solid rocket for these boosters? And so on the graphic immediately below the Teos graphic, you can see there are two rockets which are a little bit more sort of fleshed out design-wise than the top two. And that's because these were the two competing ideas for what kind of boosters you'd have. And as Gareth is noting, you have the solid rocket on the left and the liquid rocket on the right. Um, so uh, there's a question in the chat from Sir Corot of why was high operational cost favored I understand it as a side effect of low capital slash development cost, but as a goal on its own. That is an excellent question. And one of the things that the Heppenheimer uh, series describes is how the calculation that OMB did essentially sort of mathematically proved that you could have a higher operational cost if you were able to compromise on a lower cost, a lower capital development cost system and that would smooth out the budget over the life of the program rather than uh, you know, having this programmatic spike in the 1970s. And in fairness to OMB, the 1970s were a period experiencing very high inflation. So there was some economic rationale for it, but it's sort of like how Gareth, you talk about the treasury all the time, like you know, understanding the value of nothing and the price of everything. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was going to say from a net present story. value. Yeah, it's like if you did like a net, an MPV, a net present value analysis, you get a huge spike mm -hmm. at the start and then it would take a long time to tail off if you had 
uh, low operational cost but very high R and D mm-hmm. capex. And actually, yep. yeah, in the nineteen seventies when inflation is nuts, yeah, as you say, there is some economic literacy in actually pulling that capital cost down. Um, yeah, so it's, I, I can I can see the logic in that. I can see the logic yep. in it, even if I don't necessarily, even if it like goes against the grain of my uh, my my beliefs. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, yeah, um, yeah. I will briefly note, so Simon Kendler asked in the chat, why is the liquid one bigger? And then I think somebody else answered fuel density. That's exactly correct. Oh, um, nice. yeah, okay, the cool. density of the solid propellant inside the solid motor is, uh, I think, around 1.1 uh, kilogram, uh, grams per centimeter cubed. The density of the liquid oxygen and uh, kerosene that would have been used in the liquid booster is significantly lower than that. So you need higher volume of propellant, even though you can get higher total mass of propellant with uh, the larger system. It's also worth noting also that uh, solid rocket motors tend to have lower exhaust velocity than liquid rocket motors, which if you play Kerbal, you'll know is specific impulse, which means you need more total mass of propellant to achieve the same momentum delivered to your launch vehicle. Mm. Uh, so the solid motors despite being smaller, are actually a little bit less efficient um, thermodynamically and from a rocketer standpoint. But we went with solid motors because, you know, austerity. Um, So then there's a final design decision also. Like, there's three levels of design decisions here we're talking about here. And the the third is, uh, who is going to build this thing and how? So there's two two logos in the top there, Lockheed and Thiokol. Um, This represents sort of the dichotomy of who builds solid rocket propellant. there are aerospace companies like Lockheed, and they tend to be based out of places that either have an existing air base or sort of space manufacturing facility, or they tend to be based along the coast or along navigable rivers. Mm. So they just build as big of a thing as they need and transport it by barge if it needs to be transported at all and can't be just wheeled out of the factory and onto the runway or the launch pad. Yeah, yeah. Um, the Saturn V stages were all sort of built with this model. Several of them had to transport transport through the Panama Canal to get from the manufacturing plant in California to the launch site in Florida. Um, and you can build big, solid motors this way. The picture that you see there below the Lockheed logo is not a Lockheed product. It's, a, um, it's an Aerojet product. But that was one of the largest monolithic uh, single sort of casting solid rocket motors ever produced. The 260 there refers to 260 inches in diameter, and that was literally all they called it. It's just, <laughs> this is the 260 inch diameter motor. Um, and then you, on, the other, on the other side, you have uh, companies like Thiokol or uh, Hercules Inc. was another big one that they come at this from the chemical industry. They're building mm. these things with sort of the idea of like they've done chemical synthesis of industrial scale batch production of plastics, polymers, uh, solvents, that sort of thing. And uh, Hercules and Thiokol in particular were chemical manufacturers that specialized in explosives because it turns out that if you're going to build rocket propellant, it's going to have some chemical similarity with explosives. But they're all based inland in places that are fairly remote and have low population densities. So Thiokol and Hercules were both manufacturing in Utah, in the desert, uh, significantly away from population areas. And as a result, the only way you can transport these big, heavy boosters is by rail. And you can't, t- you physically can't put a rocket as long as a completed SRB onto a rail car. SRB stands for solid rocket booster. So they built it in segments, which you can see here, another version of the same picture from earlier of, this is two segments of the shuttle SRB or as you might call them, two SRMs, solid rocket motors, being spliced together uh, in the uh, rotation and surge processing building at Cape Canaveral. Um, I also throw in here United Technologies because these companies like Thiokol, they are good at making propellant and they're good at the chemistry of making the motor, but you need a partner to build the avionics. United Technologies wound up getting the contract and they had Thiokol subcontract out the motors. And this is where we make a distinction between a solid rocket booster and a solid rocket motor. The booster is the complete flight system. It's the part of the launch vehicle that provides the thrust, gets to orbit, gets recovered by parachute. The motor is the individual pieces of the booster that have propellant in it. So Thiokol was building the motors, and the United Technologies was coming along and also an add the parachutes, the nozzle, the thrust cone, the... Uh, 
avionics systems, the, uh, the sort of the aerodynamic elements required for the thing to actually fly. And United Technologies is interesting in its own right because they were initially an aerospace company that went through this just mind-blowingly like massive series of corporate mergers and consolidations. Uh, you, what you see there are that Amtrak train immediately right of the United Technologies logo. That is the United Technologies Turbo Train, America's ah. answer to the APT. <laughs> it was the Turbo Train, a gas turbine tilting train. That it's also the answer to the Dutch uh, coupluppers because you got those big, the, the big red nose, the pair of clamshell doors, so you could stick multiple of these things together. Um, it had just so many problems, and the Canadians used it for a while on Via Rail, but Amtrak very quickly got rid of them. Um, but the idea that you have a company that's both building this weirdly retro futuristic looking train and also the avionic systems for a solid rocket motor. You know, this is the military industrial complex consolidating itself at work. Yeah, big time, big time. Um, uh, Ella is asking about O rings. Yeah, absolutely, O rings. There's mm -hmm. uh, actually, I cannot recommend highly enough the um, the Challenger disaster documentary on Netflix. It's absolutely excellent. What I'd yes. recommend doing before that is watch the docudrama called The Challenger that has William Hurt playing um, uh, playing. Oh my goodness, I've just had a total mind blank. Um, What's his What's his name? The scientist Oppenheim. Uh, uh, my, one of my heroes. One of my physics heroes. Uh, uh, Feynman. Feynman. Thank you, Richard Feynman. Mm -hmm. Um, Hurt plays Feynman. Okay, Feynman's a little bit dubious. It's slightly problematic, but he is still. Yeah. He's great. Um, watch that first. Watch the docudrama first, then watch the Netflix thing. You get like hours mm -hmm. of Challenger interest, and it's fantastic. Really good combo. Yep. Watch that. But, yeah, the O rings well, failed, and the O rings were a necessity so that you could segment this thing which you might yep. be about to talk about. Um, well, sort of the, the, the short version actually is that, you know, as much as the O-ring was the technical fault that led the Challenger to uh, explode on the way to orbit, uh, the disaster was a managerial failure, yeah, first absolutely. and foremost. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. there were engineers at Thiokol who identified that this could be a problem before Challenger flew. Um, most notably, there was a guy named Roger Beaujolais who later testified at the Augustine Commission, mm -hmm. which Feynman was serving on, at, uh, to do the sort of accident investigation board and very quickly they determined like oh yeah these guys on the shop floor who are doing inspections knew about this and it was Thiokol and NASA management that made the decision to launch anyway even having been informed that it would likely put the astronauts lives at risk um we'll return to that theme in a few slides cool uh but it is sort of worth remembering that like you have a technological issue but a managerial problem. And you can easily solve a technological issue if you have the managerial problem control. Yeah, the, and the ultimately perfect. what happened, they kept using these things after Challenger because as soon as they fix the O-ring issue with the field joints, it's it works. Yeah, and the, the, the O-rings, so there are two, I mean, we're getting to the notice, so there are two O-rings. Uh, the first mm -hmm. O-ring had failed on several preceding launches. And resulted yep. in carbon buildup on the second O ring, indicating that they'd mm -hmm. been like that, that it, it had burned through. Um, mm -hmm. Which is the, the point you make about managerial, technical versus managerial. Um, probably the main permanent way disaster that's happened in the UK in, in recent history is Hatfield. That's a perfect example of this, right? You've got a technological issue that, sure, it's a, it's a thing that we understand better as a result of the incident, but that wasn't why the train derailed. That wasn't why people were killed. That wasn't why the rail shattered. The reason for that was managerial, mm -hmm. the fact that a rail to replace the knackered rail had been sat there for over a year needing to be yep. put in. It was a managerial issue. Anyway, right, we shall bump and to the next slide, it's, right? It's also worth noting that the O-ring itself was not even really the issue. The O-ring is never supposed to encounter the exhaust gases at any point during the flight. The problem is that there is just enough of a gap in the field joint between those two segments that you could have hot gases flowing through it and burn the O-rings away. The way they ultimately solved that was through three things. One, there's an additional third O-ring in the post-Challenger boosters, just as an additional precaution. But also, two, they added heaters so that the field joint would fully seal prior to booster ignition while it's sitting on the pad. Because ultimately, you know, the, the thing that made them fail in Challenger was they were launching in, you know, below freezing weather conditions. But the thing that actually makes the difference is they changed the design of the field joint itself. So there's now, in those later boosters, there's a little flap of metal shaped like a J, which is designed to expand and block the, the opening in the field joint 
as the booster internal pressure ramps up during ignition. Hmm. Ah, there you go. Oh, this anyway. we could we could we could go on and on about that that because it's fascinating. Anyway, that documentary on Netflix, but watch the watch the Challenger with William Hurt first. Uh, mm. It's it's available entirely on YouTube for free somehow. So watch that and then watch the Netflix thing. Um, right. Oh, here we go. So we got pictures of the SRB uh, and yeah. of it on its. Oh, okay, great. I'll mm-hmm. let you describe what's on screen here because there's some excellent yeah, so, pictures. So getting back to the NASA railroad here, because once they've made the decision they're going to go with a segmented SRB, they then had to sort of build the infrastructure system to get the SRB segments and components from the Thiokol plant in Utah to the launch site in Florida. So the NASA railroad, which had basically sat not really doing much of anything except occasionally handling. Uh, the Titan uh, booster mm. segments for the Air Force next door, they get this whole new lease in life. They just, they start building new facilities. Like you can see here, there are these, uh, in the main picture on the left, are these hopper cars, which are unloading gravel. That's to build the shuttle landing runway. Oh, wow. Uh, which is up until recently, like one of the longest runways in the world. Um, the only runways in the world that are longer than it are ones at very high altitude in places like Tibet, because you need more runway length if you're landing a conventional aircraft, like at 8,000 feet. Um, but so the reason the shuttle was so long is because it's basically a glider. It doesn't have any propulsion in the atmosphere once it re-enters. So it has to have a long enough runway that it is guaranteed to touch down at the start and slow down and stop and have enough room that it won't overshoot. Yeah, they can't, it so can't they, come up and run around and go go down again. It, <laughs> once it's mm-hmm. down, it's down. <laughs> Yeah. Exactly. Um, so they, they built this just massive runway and they brought in all of the gravel to build the foundations of that runway and all the concrete made the surface of that runway by rail, just as they built the KS, the, the, the Kennedy Space Center previously with the railroad. Um, they started purchasing uh, dedicated specialized tank cars to handle propellant so that like the, the, sh- the space shuttle uh, was mostly going to be using liquid hydrogen for propellant for the liquid fueled main engines on the orbiter. Mm. And so they needed a way to initially get propellant in before they had finished building the fuel farm, which would manufacture that liquid hydrogen on site. So they had these, you know, custom built ridiculous looking tank cars to handle cryogenically cold liquid hydrogen. Um, But the main thing is that they got sort of on the top right image, you can see there's this SW-1500 uh, in a sort of shuttle-esque orange and gray and black livery. Um, NASA got rid of the old S-2 switchers that we saw a couple slides back, and they replaced them with these new S-3s purchased from, I think, the Toledo, Peoria, and Western Railroad in Ohio. It's a little short line. Um at least it is today. It was significantly bigger back then. Um, but then you'll see behind it, there are these big round-looking rail cars in yellow. Those are custom-built flat cars. They're not uh, box cars. They're not sort of go- HGV like goods cars. Mm. They are flat cars, ah. specifically designed to handle the motor segments. And that round thing you see at the top, that's not a structural part of the car. That is a cover, which can be un- like pulled off by crane. Ah. Um, this image is very JPEG compressed, so you won't see exactly how that happens until a future slide but basically there's like a clamshell hinge at the top and it opens up and you can put that aside either on the ground or on another flat car next to like that's next in the consist yeah yeah um what's interesting is that they didn't uh, nasa did not own these the rail cars were owned by the railroads that would transport the booster segments from utah to cape canaveral so union pacific had a bunch um, the, pre- the precursor railroads for CSX had a bunch. Uh, I think Southern had a couple. Oh, wait. So um, there wasn't just one class one uh, that did this. There were like no, no. multiple class ones that were transporting these things. Uh, to know what yes. class ones are, listen to the Justin episode from the start mm-hmm. of the, the year, folks. <laughs> yep. And it's also worth remembering that uh, in the 19, uh, early 1970s, when this was going on, uh, was – uh, at the same time as the Penn Central bankruptcy. So the Class 1 railroads were undergoing massive corporate changes of mergers, acquisitions, bankruptcies, and bailout to form Conrail um, at the same time as all the aerospace companies were also doing all of the mergers and acquisitions and corporate changeovers, bankruptcies, and bailouts associated with <laughs> the transition from the Apollo program to the shuttle program and the associated changes in the military-industrial complex for you know as the Cold War progressed, right? Um, so 
the ownership of all of his hardware is a little bit sort of, you know, it's hard to keep track of. So we're not going to worry about it. Just know that there are these specialized flat cars with these fancy covers to transport the motor segments across the country. Um, and then finally, at the bottom right, there's this is a cutaway diagram from the original uh, sort of documentation for the shuttle. And you'll notice it's sort of it's divided into some pieces. Uh, starting from the left, there is the nose cone and the frustum, which are basically there for two things. One, so that it's got some aerodynamics to it. But also, too, that's where the parachutes get stored. So these things can be recovered and reused later. Uh, then there's the forward skirt, which is where the avionics are contained. That's the computers that govern the solid rocket motors, uh, basically the, the thrust vectoring for the nozzle. Um, once you light a solid rocket motor, you can't throttle it. So they don't really control throttle like you would in a liquid rocket. But there's they are very important the, for... Exactly. Yeah. So they, they, they physically sort of rotate the nozzle on the X and Y axes to direct the thrust and steer. Um, and then you have behind the forward skirt, there are four motor segments, which are identical except for the rear one, because the rear one is what attaches to the aft skirt and the uh, nozzle extension. So the important thing to, re to remember here is that the only thing that's being transported back and forth across the country is the four motor segments. The nose cap, the frustum, and the forward and aft skirts are kept on KSC uh, territory while they're being refurbished because they don't need to be filled with propellant. The only thing that's happening in Utah is they're inspecting the motor segments and refilling them with propellant. Hmm. Um, but everything else stays on KSC. And yeah, because there's no point in transporting that thing across the country. Just mm -hmm. bring it back, you know, fish it out the out the ocean, bring it back, clean it, exactly. tidy it up, test it. Happy days. Mm -hmm. And this is part of why also you had the subcontractor arrangement between United Technologies and Thiokol. So Thiokol could handle the propellant stuff in Utah with the motor segments, and United Technologies had contract facilities at Kennedy Space Center specifically mm -hmm. to handle the avionics materials, the parachutes, the nozzles, etc. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, to answer uh, Raphael, your question of asking how much longer we'll be going, um, uh, not too. I, I don't know. What, what do you reckon? Another. Um, who yeah, knows? we are way over. <laughs> I, we we can get the the slides after this one are basically walking through the flow of getting a booster from Utah to the Cape. So you know that will go pretty quickly. I think For, we're not um, rushing, folks. Basically, but uh, no. if it, it, it's it, this doesn't disappear, you can uh, you can come watch it later. So um, it's fine. The only the only mm -hmm. pressure is making sure John gets back to his lunch break. But uh, it's fine. Yeah, the, um, the pressure is making sure I get back to my actual job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whereas, whereas for me, it's just uh, it's having dinner, yeah. so it's fine. Mm -hmm. Right, okay, so we'll go to the next slide. That's, that's a good slide with lots of bits on it. I, I like that. That's, that's um, a useful diagram. Mm -hmm. uh, ah, right, we're now looking at... Ah, okay, so some interesting mm -hmm. things going to be, to be yeah, talked so about. Yeah, so the, the next four slides have a series of maps and aerial images that show sort of what is the route these things take en route from Utah to the uh, the Cape. Um the first thing to note here is so this is in a the, the background map images in Utah. You'll notice there is a label on the left side called Promontory Point. Uh, that's historically notable because that is the site where the first transcontinental railroad mm. linked up from the construction teams building east and west. You, there's that famous picture in the bottom there, which shows that link up ceremony occurring on May 10, 1869. Um, which the fire plant. It's worth saying is, there's a good picture to look up, which is the. That's a picture with all the engineers. There's a good picture that was recreated by the ancestors of the um, uh, indentured servitude people. I dare say they mm -hmm. were like paid pretty, yep. pretty poor wages uh, mm -hmm. and trapped to deliver generally people from largely Chinese uh, people. Yeah, in, so in the, the Union servitude. Pacific, the Union Pacific, which built from Omaha West, was mostly Irish immigrants, and the Central Pacific, which built from Sacramento East, was mostly Chinese immigrants. Mm -hmm. But either way, migrant labor immigrants who basically just recently come off the boat from their, you know, the the homes of their ancestors and immediately sort of get brought in to build a railroad. Yeah. So there's a really cool picture of them, of their, of, of their ancestors um, mm -hmm. kind of me, kind of recreating this image, which is quite nice. Anyway, sorry, yeah. I, I, I digress. Anyway, but yeah. um, the important thing to note here is two things. One, the Thiokol plant is right there on the line, only about, you know, five miles or so from the completion point. 
And the other thing to note is that this track did not last very long. The original Transcontinental Railroad is still mostly intact and used today as it was built, except for this portion. Oh, really? What happened was, by the early 1900s, the Central Pacific had gotten acquired by the Southern Pacific, which was just big multi-state system that had everything from the Pacific Northwest to Houston, Texas. And they took control of this line. They basically said, wait a second, this, this route through Promontory to get to Utah is way too curvy, way too steep. We can do better. And they literally built a causeway and a viaduct across the Great Salt Lake, which is just flat. And it not only saves them from having to go up a mountain, it saves yeah. them having to you know, go around the lake. So it was faster on both counts. This meant that the last passenger train uh, was uh, ran over this original line before the 1920s. And by 1942, it had been abandoned completely. <laughs> the Thiokol plant, therefore, did not have rail access when the shuttle program was initiated in the 1960s and when it started you know, manufacturing booster segments in the 19. 70s so what they ha and, and you can look on like if you find some lidar imagery right this is sort of me plugging remote sensing stuff because that's what you know, <laughs> part of what i actually do uh, if you want to find old railroad lines that are not marked on something like open rail map or an ordnance survey lidar is a really cool thing because it can show you the topography of buried um or eroded landforms especially artificial ones like railroad right-of-way uh the thing to note here is that you look on the LiDAR imagery and there is not an abandoned siding at the Thiokol plant. So what they had to do was they basically had to truck the segments on a many wheeled sort of, you know, oversized load truck several miles from the Thiokol plant along uh, a Utah state route, which follows the original Central Pacific line to a siding down here in Corrine, Utah. And you can see at the top right, there's a satellite image from I believe that's either 1995 or 2013. I don't remember which one I finally sent in the in the images here, but you can see there are some rail cars on a siding next to a building, and they look like they have that same orange paint that the SRB segment, uh, the SRB covers had on the flat cars. That's because they are. Yeah, yeah, okay. That's this image so, here, this one here. Yeah. Yes, that bit there. So they load these things up on the flat cars from the truck with a gantry crane, and then the Union Pacific takes them over the you know, the, the original Transcontinental Railroad as far as Omaha. Uh, you can see there's a Union Pacific locomotive with some rocket booster uh, cars behind it coming out of a tunnel through the Wasatch grade. Um, and once they get there, they transfer it to a different class one. They ultimately make their way to Jacksonville where they hand it off to the Florida East Coast. And then on the next slide, the Florida East Coast hands them off to NASA. Um, <laughs> so... You'll notice here, there's this, I've sort of pasted some images in around this map, right? So there's two things going on here. The FEC right of way you can see along the edge of the land mass on the left side of the screen. And there's what in the US we call a Y, in Britain it's called I think, a triangle. Yep. Um, and then you have a uh, like four or five track yard uh, called JJ yard, which is just uh, west of the, or e just east of the triangle. Um, the FEC basically, they'd pull the train of rocket motors into that siding, and then they would have the NASA locomotive pulls it from there across the Indian River Bridge uh, to the Cape itself. Like actually, you can see that you can, this, this picture, this nice picture here, you can sort of see the, uh, you can see where they come in, and you can see the yard here, mm -hmm. which is I'm drawing on green, which is red on green, which is terrible for people with them. Um, yeah. Uh, color blindness uh, that you can see just at the follow that arrow down you see the yard and then you see the bridge just beyond mm -hmm. here which is here so yeah something that's nice. sort of also notable here is that um the the motor segment cars are not lined up back to back like you'd expect they would be and that's so that they can distribute the weight of these heavy booster segments <laughs> over the bridge Bridges. and not overload a specific part of the bridge at any given time um Early on in the program and uh, before Challenger and late in the program after Columbia in 2003, uh, they tended to ship the boosters with those spacer cars already in place. But there was a period in the 1990s when the flight rate for the shuttle was so high that they were just shipping boosters when they got them. So there would be this sort of shunting dance occurring in JJ Yard 
after FEC delivers them, where often the NASA switcher would have to place the spacer cars in between the booster cars, oh my goodness. and then on the other side of the bridge, remove them again. Uh, uh, that's the ultimate fiddle yard, folks. Good grief. Mm-hmm. Like, trying to get the... Try... <laughs> yeah, no, that's no fun for the shunter. Mm-hmm. Um, It'd be great fun for a model, but, you know. And I'm, I'm also noticing that down here... We've got yet another NASA liveried uh, mm-hmm. loco. Actually, it's, it's the same loco as the previous one, right? They've just repainted yep. it. They've re- yep. repainted so they... it to new NASA livery. Mm-hmm. Uh, so something I I think I might have forgotten to mention though is that when they did this upgrade of the railroad to support the shuttle, they basically brought all the railroad operations in house. So they had a locomotive maintenance and repair shop where they completely overhauled not just the NASA SW-1500s, but several other shunters for the Air Force at Vandenberg, or at uh, Cape Canaveral. Um, And they did repaints whenever NASA went under a new sort of logo scheme. The one you can see there with the blue and white is uh, the sort of, I think, post-2001 rebranding when they switched from the the Swiggly Worm logo to the Circular Meatball logo. Yeah. Um, but even you know after that point, they only repainted a couple of them into that blue and white scheme. There's still there were I think at least one was still in the orange livery from from before, right up until the end of the program. Um, so there for the livery nerds. There you go. Um, oh, they, and they also a they custom for... built rail cars. The facility they custom built a oh, couple yeah. for like transporting helium for pressure inside the fuel tanks. Oh, um they custom built some to just handle internal materials within the center, like to get from the industrial area to the VAB or the launch pads. Um, they had a whole massive operation there. It's, there's some great documentaries on it from the 90s and that NASA itself produced at the end of the program. Some of them are on YouTube. They're well worth watching. Yeah, there's a question about signaling. I don't know. I, yeah, I, I, what, what, mm. Do you know anything about the signaling uh, for this <laughs> ra- railway? Oh, I, I, this is going to make most of the people outside the U.S. cringe, but... Uh, all of this is signal dark territory, Mo- as is a significant portion of the United States rail network and indeed the broad North American rail network right up until very recently with the PTC mandate. Um, all of the signaling that's occurring here is essentially timetable train order where you have a sheet of paper that says, here is the time your train is supposed to get from point A to point B. Here is the occupancy of tracks you're allowed to operate on. Here is the manifest of cars you're picking up and dropping off at each point. Um, and for this, for, for NASA in particular, like for this railroad, that was as good as it needed to be because you would never have more than one train movement per, uh, like, Section, essentially right, per yeah. time when they're doing a mission. Oh, yeah, okay, um, yeah, I got you. Yeah, I see a question. Force A one. What does the railroad look like to Vandenberg? We have that in several in a couple slides. Oh, cool. Okay, crikey. Um, but yeah. yeah, you're you're gonna you're gonna basically be in a situation where like, if they're bringing in boosters for a mission or sending spent boosters back, that's the only train movement that's going to happen on the railroad that day. Until until it isn't, and there's a disaster. <laughs> So that was that's the thing. Like uh, the original goal for the shuttle program was to have this ridiculously high flight rate. Like you're yeah, supposed yeah. to be able to turn these things around in a few days or weeks, and that just never happened. Um, the the one shuttle that flew the most was Discovery, and in a particular year, the most times it flew was four times. Yeah, um, yeah. And the the highest flight rate for the whole program was in 1985. They launched nine missions. So this is not ever going to have quite enough cargo transmitting a transported across it to warrant any kind of fancy signaling system by u.s standards but even then fancy by u.s standards is still fairly rudimentary internationally <laughs> <laughs> right on to the next image then or the next mm. set of images aha well it's talking of discovery mm-hmm. there is discovery in the bottom corner yeah so uh, once we get uh the segments in from the transfer point um they're stored at a siding about five miles north of the vab uh, the, the the assembly building uh, before they're brought into the center itself. Uh, yeah, Kara, just point out that logo there on the top left image of do not hump. That's a instruction for yard crews on the class one to, to not shunted, put these yeah. over a hump yard. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it's still funny. It's funny. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so what the, basically the problem is you can't have these sort of massive explosive devices stored at the vehicle assembly building because that's where everything else has to come to. So they... Very quickly after the program started, uh, there was there was a few initial deliveries straight to the VAB, 
but they subsequently started, they, they built this new facility called the Rotation Processing and Surge Building, or the RPSF, F for facility. Um, and what they would do is they'd have, one, one at a time, the segments would be backed into the building by one of the shunters, and they have enough spacer cars there so that the shunter never physically enters the building so that they can maintain a clean lab environment in the building where they need to actually make the segments, uh, sort of inspect the segments and put them together. Yeah, the last thing you want is diesel um, fumes pumping through. I mean, also exactly. you, could, you could electrify it, folks, but, you know. Mm -hmm. you, you could have electrified this at the time. Uh, one of the drawbacks of being in Florida, though, is that, you know, I, I, I shudder to think what the OLE engineers would think about, you know, having to make OLE hurricane-proof. Yeah, that's a fair uh, point. Yeah. That, for, for the space people, OLE is overhead line equipment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, yeah, it's true. It's true. But uh, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. But so it, where, where you just point out there, Gareth, is the, the vehicle assembly building. That's where all of these segments get put together to make a rocket booster and then joined with the external tank, which is brought in by barge from Louisiana and with the orbiter, which is brought from next door at one of the orbiter processing facilities, basically their hangar. And then you can sort of see in this aerial image, the crawler way that leads out to the two pads, 39, 39A and B. Um, just north of there in the image that's at the top, uh, you can see that sort of loop in the crawler way that goes around the VAB. Um, just north of there is where they have this uh, the rotation processing search facility. So inside that building there, yeah, right there with the arrow, um, inside that building there are two 200-ton gantry cranes, and their sole job is to take these things off the rail car, well, first of all, pull the cover off the rail car, and then take the... Uh, booster segment off and flip it vertical. And there's this whole process that's been documented in extreme detail through NASA's historical office. Uh, I, can, I have a PDF copy that I can probably put in the description later if you want to. Mm. But there's this whole process of like securing the segment with, you know, 132 different pin joints so that it's secured to the rail car and then securing those to the cranes and then having the cranes do this dance because you, you have to use both cranes to rotate this thing you can't just have it with one i was gonna say yeah so, there's two i can well i'm gonna go back to red but you can see the two mm -hmm. different cranes independently like presumably being independently operated or or you know yep. operated in they, unison I, in any case so there's mm -hmm. one crane here oh that red is awful ls i'm so sorry and then the other crane here so two yes. separate cranes right mm-hmm and they have to, they have separate operators, but they have to work together. So there's constant communication loop between the crane operators and the crew on the ground who are supervising and everything. Um, so once you get all these things upright, uh, the aftmost segment has to be mated to the nozzle and the aft thrustum, the uh, aft skirt, so that you know it has all of the avionics and connections associated with the thrust vectoring. And then those all get moved by truck from the RPSF to a storage building. And then only once they're ready to be assembled, do they go to the VAB. Crikey. And then, so after you have the whole shuttle is assembled and the payload is integrated in the cargo bay, you roll it out to the crawler way and launch the puppy. Yeah, as I was gonna say, that's when you press the go button and uh, mm -hmm. up it pops. Yeah, yep. crikey. Um, that's um, awesome. And it's, it's a ridiculous process because like there's all of these, you know, massive number of checklist steps for hours and hours before the countdown, you know, independently of all this logistics stuff that's happened beforehand. Um, and then it operates for two and a half minutes and then it's done its job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's huge fuss. And then it's, you know, you could count, mm -hmm. you could, you could accurately count the number of seconds without looking at your watch that it actually does its thing and then yep. it falls out of the sky. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It's amazing. But then it's still not done because you got to recover the thing, which is on the next slide. Ah, Yes. So here it is. It's gone splashy. Mm -hmm. Here it is. Yeah. Uh, so the yeah. boosters land in the water. Um, they have little GPS trackers on them, so you know where they are. But what's not interesting is that the, the 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 whole thing is a hollow tube with a cap at one end, and most of the weight is at the nozzle end. So once it hits the water, it settles onto a vertical configuration <laughs> and it floats because there's, there's air trapped inside the tube where the propellant used to be. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So it just floats nicely like this. Oh, that's quite mm -hmm. cool. Yeah, so you have a set of divers has to go down to put a cap in there to plug the end. Um, and then you have a pair of ships that come out. Uh, there is one called the uh, Liberty Star and one called the Freedom Star because, you know, USA. Um, basically, they attach tow lines to these things and then tow them back through Port Canaveral and a canal along the Banana River to this location here uh, in the top right image, which is on Cape Canaveral 
uh, Air Force slash Space Force station uh, grounds. And you can see there's a gantry crane there that picks up the booster out of the water and slots it onto a flat car. And then that flat car moves it into a hangar where they basically wash off all the salt water so there's no corrosion. And then they clean off all of the burnt off insulation from the thermal protection system that surrounds the booster segments. And they break the segments down so that you have the various pieces are separated. And once they're separated, the parts that stay on Kennedy Center uh, property until the next mission get sent to uh, this building here most in, in the bottom center. Um, uh, so, wait a minute. This th here. Uh, the one that's to oh, the... Oh, this one. Uh, no, the next one over. This one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that big <laughs> complex right there was where they refurbished all the parts of the booster that stayed at Kennedy. And then there's that freight yard you see just to the... Uh, on the on the map, it's uh, northwest, but on the image, it's a little bit down. Yeah, and yeah. that freight yard is where they stored all of the cars required to take the train back to Utah while the booster was in orbit or was uh you know in processing to fly yeah, yeah um and they have a crane over at the north end of that where they would re put the covers back uh, put the booster back on the car and then put the cover back on the booster i was gonna say there's a nice image there showing how the uh mm -hmm. showing how this kind of clamshell cover works right that's, that's yep. kind of a nice image exp explain it and, and you, showing the flatbed there there's the, if, there's the if you want to see the this process in video the best video i've seen was a documentary produced for pbs's uh, American Public Broadcasting Service is a program called All Aboard in the 1990s, which is basically the U.S. equivalent of Railway Roundabout, um, but made in the 1990s. <laughs> um, they have a whole sequence of uh, sort of shooting in film the shunting process of moving the cars forward and back and putting the covers back on and putting the boosters on. Um, I've not found any better video of that process. The one caveat is the gantry crane was out of service that day, so they had just a big crawler crane built and do the job instead. <laughs> Whoops. Yep. <laughs> anyway, Amazing. so that's the journey. Uh, once they get through here, they just send them back to Utah the same way they came. Straight back the way they came. Uh, yep. Causing a little bit less track damage on their return. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, amazing. I mean, yep. it's quite it's quite the epic journey. And... and I mean, I'm trying to think what, yeah, I mean, what, I'm just trying to think of the gauge clearance work that you'd have to do to decide that route. I mean, are there any particularly strange moves that they have to do to avoid things? I suppose, like, I don't know, what's the path like? Is it quite a weavy route that they have to do, or is it? Uh, well, pretty much all railroads in the U.S. are a little bit weavy in some yeah, way or other. Right. Um, there, there are the tunnels that you saw in the image from the mm. Union Pacific slide, several slides back with the that coming off the Wasatch grade. And I think there's a couple other ones um, in the sort of in at either like uh, southern Tennessee or northern Georgia where it would cross the Appalachians. But you could also bypass that by going along the Gulf Coast. Um, and I don't remember off the top of my head exactly what route they took. Uh, I do know that it changed a couple times because uh, on one of the shipments, uh, the locomotives at the front of the train, uh, basically they, they went collapsing a 100-plus-year-old trestle that was still in use. Oh, None grief. of the boosters were damaged, I don't think, but uh, they had to sort of reroute away from <laughs> that bridge briefly while it was being repaired. Oh, my goodness. Uh <laughs> Well, there we go. Yeah, don't mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah. I suppose better the better the locos than the flat cars. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't like to be the one explaining that I'd thrown an SRB segment uh, on the dirt. That would be a that would not be a good mm. chat. I mean, it's bad enough seeing those images of of Boeing airframes that have hit the dirt when the when the train carrying them derailed. That that picture yeah. makes me wince every time I see it. Anyway, right. So the next image. Mm -hmm. Ah, so this is stuff that didn't happen. Okay. Yeah. Um, as is previously mentioned, the Vandenberg Railroad. So Vandenberg Air Force Base is where NASA originally wanted uh, to launch as the second launch site. And the, the reasons for this, we can, you, know, you can look at more of that on, offline if you're interested. But basically, Florida lets you launch onto a orbit that goes sort of what they call equatorial. It's not at you know, the equator's latitude, but it's orbiting in the same direction as the Earth rotates. Mm. Uh, if you're launching from into a polar orbit, though, which is what you mostly want to have for Earth observation satellites, like for spy satellites, if you're yeah. the Air Force or the NSA, uh, you need to have a site that can launch on a trajectory that goes southwesterly. 
And so Southern California was selected for that. Uh, Vandenberg has been used for a lot of polar orbit launches outside the shuttle, uh, but it was not used for the shuttle because by the time they got it running, the Challenger disaster had happened and the Air Force decided they didn't want to launch national security payloads for reconnaissance flights on the shuttle anymore. <laughs> yeah, um, But they did go to the trouble of building a rail spur from the Southern Pacific's main line along the coast up the hill to the launch complex. And you can see there's a picture of that Vandenberg launch complex just to the right of that map. Mm. Um, some things to note here is that one, that Southern Pacific main line is still used for the, not just freight, but also for Amtrak. If you catch the Coast Starlight and you look out the uh, right side of the train if you're going northbound, one, you'll have a great view because all the other passengers are looking at the left side because there's a pretty ocean coastline. But also you'll see a lot of both the in-use and old disused launch pads that were at Vandenberg for various things. Um, and then uh, the other thing to note is that unlike at Kennedy where all of these things are, you know, the, 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 the hardware for the shuttle goes to all these different buildings and then gets moved between them, at Vandenberg, they have all of the hardware centralized at one spot on the launch pad, and the buildings themselves move. Yeah, <laughs> that's what's so happening. So they're on rails, too. Um, so there's a, sh there's a shuttle there. There's, 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 there's an actual orbiter there. So yep. That is the Space Shuttle Enterprise, which was the uh, first one the, built, yeah. and it was only ever used for the test program. It never flew to space. Um, and that's a... Uh, a simulated external tank, I think. I don't know if that's a flight production one. And those uh, rocket motors you see on the side, the SRBs, are also, I believe, simulated rather than flight flight hardware. Yeah, yeah. Um, but they, they basically, what they found in the review for Vandenberg after the program was that not only was the Air Force disinterested, but also they had rushed to build this launch site, and there were serious environmental issues that were resulting from it. Oh, um, the big one is sort of the, the water system that keeps the shuttle's boosters from destroying the pad when it lifts off with the sheer sound vibrations from the exhaust um they wound up th those water systems wound up requiring more water than the california water infrastructure could supply oh God. which more relatable problems for the present day uh because that problem's only gotten worse <laughs> yeah i was gonna say that that yeah um, oh dear yeah um, but then, so so that was pre-Challenger. After Challenger, uh, there was a part of NASA that basically was like, hey, we should probably have a different booster design that is safer than the ones we currently have. And so there was this program that ran from 1988 to 1993, you can see the date there in the corner, called the Advanced Solid Rocket Motor Program, or the ASRM. I throw this in there for a couple of reasons. The first is that this is the ultimate debunking of the myth that the shuttle boosters were designed for railway loading gauge clearances. The reason is these segments are much bigger than the ones used in the actual shuttle. Not only are they longer, they're four inches wider. Ah, okay, yep. Mm -hmm. And one thing that's, not, that's important to note there is that even though this design, as you can see, only has three segments, the segments ha between them have about 20% more propellant mass. So this would have theoretically enabled the space shuttle to do more elaborate launches and heavier payloads with more energetic trajectories. Yeah. Um, if you look at the, this is, it's, also, it's also an interesting story from a standpoint of like what we've talked about previously, of, you know, managerial solutions, or managerial problems with technological solutions. Uh, the GAO report associated with this program right when it was canceled in 1992, basically came down and said, look, we get that you've built most of the factory required for this thing in Tennessee. We get that you're almost ready to ship the first prototypes, but also we don't think you know what you're doing. <laughs> it was a new contractor. It wasn't Thiokol. Um, they were going to use some weirdly advanced metallurgy techniques to build the segments themselves, and they had this new design for the field joint connecting the segments, and the JO report had been written by some rather clever engineers. So, you know, the same people who were doing the austerity stuff that crippled the shuttle to begin with now come back and have a competent engineering response to someone saying, hey, I think we should use a bolt to uh, take a normal stress instead of a sheer stress. <laughs> yeah, that's that's good because I'm seeing bolt yep. and I'm thinking that's not a good idea for something mm -hmm. that's this is a bolt and the loads are going like this and this mm. either so, side of so it. 
And there's yeah, your so bolt that's actually, here. So the, 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 the shuttle field joints on the segments they used also used bolts. Um, and they were made to be you know, extremely sturdy and they have you know, exact torque requirements, make sure they're properly fitted. The difference here is that the ones on the advanced solid rocket motor, which never was built, are taking normal stress instead of shear. So the, the, sheer, the, the stress arrows you've just drawn are actually orthogonal to where the stress would actually be applied to that bolt. Ah, okay. Yep. So mm -hmm. stress um, coming in like this. Uh, in fact, yeah, it's a, it's, I think, I don't remember if it was tensile, it was tensile or compressive stress, but the point is that, um, with a shear, you can basically maintain the configuration of the field joint. If you have it under tension though, there's a risk the joint opens up and then you have the exact same problem as the oh, SRBs had in Challenger, but worse. Yeah. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. That's so bad. these things never got built. Um, and then after uh, the Columbia disaster, which was not related to the solid rocket motors, uh, it was related to the heat shield system and the thermal protection on the uh, insulation on the external tank. Mm. But after Columbia, basically NASA got authorization and the Bush administration got very enthusiastic about replacing the shuttle with something new. And they decided to use the shuttle hardware and technology to build a new pair of rockets that would take us to the moon and Mars. Um, so this is Project Constellation. If you would like to read more about that, there's the second Augustine Commission report in 2009, which basically was like, hey, this thing is not getting anywhere near enough money. And also there's technical problems. Um, but you can imagine that, you know, a vehicle, a, a, a rocket, a, a launch vehicle system, which has reusable main engines and rocket boosters, uh, which are designed for a very specific configuration of the shuttle, doesn't lend itself very well to building an expendable launch vehicle. Um, they, they were planning to use the shuttle main engines on the Ares 5, which is the big rocket on the left, and then they found that those would be inadequate thrust-wise and they couldn't do, you know, they, they would not be able to be reused since they're too expensive, so switched to a different engine, and then that led to other problems with thermal systems. But the big one for the SRBs is that these configurations of SRBs use five segments instead of four. That doesn't really change anything for the transport logistics, but it does change things for the loads on the booster and how they're constructed. So the new SRBs that are being built for the um, Constellation program for the Ares 1 and Ares 5 wind up being much more complex machines than the ones built for the shuttle. And it's still taken them, you know, they, they started this program in 2003 and it They've only just in the last couple of years gotten one of these things to uh, light and have a full burn test properly. Oh, crikey. I didn't realize they were that far behind in it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's it's taken them a long time. And also, like, Constellation itself has been canceled since 2009 because it was just, it was it wound up being never tenable. Um, but so on the next slide is what we got instead. Uh, so on the left there, you see a rocket which looks eerily similar to the Ares 5, but it's not. That's the SLS. That is the current NASA launch vehicle development program. It's also meant to be a moon and or Mars rocket, but the reason it exists is because right at 2009, uh, when the Obama administration took office, uh, the Senate basically comes up and says, hey, listen, I know that we are at the end of the shuttle program, and we're going to try and you know, do something else instead of Constellation because the previous administration's own report from the Augustine Commission says it's not going to work. But we would like you to build a new rocket anyway that still uses all these shuttle parts so that all the contractors associated with the project can still have some work to do. So it's not a bad rocket in and of itself. It's probably going to be fine, but it has it was never intended to have a high flight rate. And as a result, it's very, very expensive. And uh, yeah. the other thing that's worth noting is that none of the parts associated are reusable. So once the shuttle program ended and they start developing this new SLS booster that's just going to be expendable, all of the transportation logistics associated with the program basically got sold off. Yeah. So the, there's that, that same SW1500 switcher down there at the bottom, number two, that we saw previously. That's also sitting at the Gold Coast Railroad Museum in Florida uh, as a museum piece. The other two SW1500 switchers got sold off to small railroads. You can see in the top right, there's one that got sent to the Madison Railroad in Indiana. Uh, you'll also notice there's a NASA meatball logo on, on the on the side there with the NASA 
uh, abbreviation replaced with the Madison Railroad reporting mark. Um, <laughs> I don't know if that violates NASA's uh, media policy, but I'm yeah, not going to raise too many questions that's about a, it. That's a brand violation right there. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, yeah or something. Um, but they still need a way to deliver the segments for the shuttle, bo the SLS boosters. And so rather than having all of this sort of in-house infrastructure, basically what NASA did is they rented a uh, road rail mover car, ironically called the shuttle wagon, and they use that to bring the boosters from the interchange at MIMS into the uh, processing facility at Canaveral. Um, you'll notice it's a longer train. It's got 10 segments instead of eight, but it's the same basic idea, just with a wimpy little road rail mover instead of a locomotive. So wait, why did they get rid of the look? Couldn't they have just kept one locomotive to do that job? Or did it just seem cheaper just buy a, a road rail uh vehicle? It's extremely cheap to rent one of these things, uh, but also like the the whole the, the reason why they brought the program in house for the shuttle program originally was because they anticipated a much higher flight yeah, rate okay, than they ever time. actually yeah. achieved. And SLS is never scheduled to fly more than once per year, and even once per year is ambitious. Yeah. Um, the current schedule for launches on SLS. Uh, the, the, the first mission has slipped. It was originally going to be like 2017 and then it moved to 2018 and it still hasn't flown and we don't know when it's going to fly, but they're getting the pieces ready to go at, Ken at, at, at Kate Kennedy. Um, and then once that happens, you know, the next one is sort of off in the vague future. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the, the Artemis program has this sort of notional timeline of when things are going to launch. That is entirely contingent upon the people building SLS being able to build it rapidly enough and in volume enough to meet that timeline. And the whole point of the program was not to build these things on a rapid timeline. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. It just feels um, like the, the wrong way to do... Um, mm -hmm. The wrong way to... Do, uh, yeah, it's um, SLS and, is problematic on a number of levels. Yeah, and as a result of that, you know, there's this continuous sort of worry in the air hanging over NASA of, is Congress going to cancel SLS at some point? So they're not particularly keen on investing in a new set of permanent railroad infrastructure yeah. for a program that might get canceled after one or two flights. Yep, yeah, it's understandable. And the consequence mm -hmm. of that is not just in, in rail vehicles being made obsolete. Uh, there's a fleet, there's a, what looks like a small Navy sitting doing nothing down mm -hmm. here, right? That is the James River Reserve Fleet in Virginia, uh, which was uh, ironically a little bit, it's like it's only about two miles from where I went to undergrad. Um, but that's where the two recovery ships wound up. The Freedom Star and Liberty Star were both sent to this reserve fleet in uh, 2013 or 14, I think. Um, and they were there for a couple of years, and then they were acquired by, I think, like Merchant Marine, uh, the Merchant Marine for training purposes or something. Um, so they've briefly were in storage at this reserve fleet. Um, I also throw this image in here because there's two British things in this picture for the oh, yeah. UK audience. Uh, hint, they're not ships. Oh, uh, oh, what, what, oh, let me, what can I spy? It's in here. Is there something that's so, in here? Uh, so for, uh, the, 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 first of all, you see, now it's not in there, um, where that question mark is, follow the apex of the little nugget on the uh, the uh, the curve on the question mark up. You see, there's an island on the far shore of the river. Oh yeah, over here. That is Jamestown Island. Oh. That is the site of the first British permanent settlement in the Americas. All oh, right. Oh, cool. I mean, not cool. Boo. But also interesting. And boo for colonialism, but also you know, it's a historically important thing. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. And then the other thing is, this is kind of a sort of you know bringing my geology back into it because that's what I was <laughs> formerly trained in. Uh, the, the river sediments are all eroded off of the Appalachians, which are the same rock units that comprise the Scottish Highlands and a number of other mountain ranges across Northern and Western Europe. Because prior to the break of Pangaea, it was all one continent. Same rock, same rock. Yeah. Wait, mm -hmm. which was, was it, um, it's not a sandstone based. Uh, some of it is sandstone, some of it is limestone, because um, what happened basically is there's a sequence of sedimentary deposition from the ancient Iapetus Ocean, which was the ocean that existed before the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and then when Pangaea formed, that closed up. And so there was a mountain building event similar to what the Himalayas are going through right now, yeah. where the continent collision occurs. So some of those units got metamorphosed. Um, and then, you know, in the present day with the 
you know, the splitting of the Atlantic, it's all being eroded back down as sediment through the rivers. Um, I will note, though, that like this has happened at least four or five different times of an ocean where the Atlantic is sort of splitting and, reop- uh, and reclosing. Uh, so there's versions of this same origenic sequence of mountain building, sedimentation and erosion right. that go back for two billion years. I mean, our, the, the, the tectonic plate, This we've digressed massively, and we've only got six minutes before smashing the air and potentially making this the longest episode. Mm. But um, uh, our, the, the tectonic plates move around really quickly. Like, I'm Under pretty sure time skills, at yeah. the moment, you are getting further away from me at the speed at which my thumbnail is growing. I think that's basically Something like the that. stat. Yeah. Mm. The yeah. tectonics in the western part of the U.S. are a little wonky because there's a, a ghost plate called the Farallon Plate that fully subducted underneath North America, and that's why the San Andreas Fault exists in California. Ah, um, oh, so we're actually un- the north. The western coast of North America is decompressing from the rest of the continent as the built-up stress of the uh, convergent collision between North America and the Farallon Plate is being replaced with the strike-slip fault motion between North America and the Pacific Plate. So basically, the Rocky Mountains are getting unsprung. Oh, wow. Crikey. Uh, yeah. So the, the Mid-Atlantic yeah, and there's Ridge stuff like is, is the uplift out. from the ice ages from the glaciers physically pushing the you know, crust down with buoyancy, but like, you know. Oh, yeah, we have that in the UK as well. Like the the, the, the island yep. of oh, the, the British mainland island is is rotating as a result of the up, still having the uplift effect from when the ice went mm-hmm. away, which is kind of cool. Anyway, good grief, yeah. we've digressed. Anyway, this isn't Geonatter. Yeah, yeah, it, well, it can be. Uh, and it, indeed it will be at some point. Oh, good grief. We have reached, we have reached the termination of the of the episode. Oh, my goodness me. Um, John, that was awesome. That was really Thank awesome. Um, hopefully, we audio described that suitably for everyone listening. Thanks so much uh, for, for listening. You can listen to it in all the normal places. You all know that. What's next? Uh, 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 next is... Um, oh, it's the, yeah, it's the ad. Patreon. You know where you're going for Patreon uh, to support this happening more. Discord is fun. Go to that. GarethDennis.uk slash Discord. All the fun happens in there. Uh, and PayPal, if you fancy it. I, I, never, I don't like dwelling on these. I feel awkward every time this slide appears. Um, uh, adverts. Uh, I have to plug Tim because uh, the series is great. You can't watch it if you're in the US, though. I'm so sorry. Uh, if you're in the US, it's... So Tim's show, The Architecture of the Railway is Built, is brilliant. It's been syndicated to, the, to Australia. So it is potentially going to get syndicated to the US. I, I, it's just If you plug... If you hammer your... Whichever channel is most likely to syndicate it... P- prod them and ask them to buy it um, and then you'll be able to watch it also you can probably get it illegally somewhere so there's that um but anyway the last episode was a really good one it went to barrow hill roundhouse which had lots of many colorful electric locomotives in it like these the three in the middle here are three early ac locos in the uk and i love them so um yeah that was a fun episode other plugs ah the next episode micah's bester um is joining us to talk about railway staff safety through time so we're going to talk about the various ways in which we as a railway um injure or worse our staff which uh is uncomfortably contemporary at the moment actually so that is going to be interesting i think it might end up with mike asking me more questions than i asked mike so that should be a really interesting one and then the week after that that's all right i'm double i'm double plugging the week after that is the one year anniversary special of rail matter coming into existence so this is episode 50 which normally people get excited about uh, technically this is the 51st episode um and uh, and yeah, so but forget that. So a year of of rail matter is happening in two weeks, and we're going to have all of the Patreon people in that call. There's going to be them. They're going to be here on this screen waving. It's going to be like it's going to be like Ranga Nation. Uh, they're all going to clap. It's going to be a bit disjointed and probably reasonably unprofessional. But we're also going to talk about like going to give some awards. Oh, it's talking of which. Uh, that's an excuse for me to bring the side by side up. I have here a gold can of paint. Ooh, what might I be doing with this gold can of paint and this one? What am I going to be doing with them? Well, we'll find out in that episode, probably, uh, if it works. Oh, anyway, that's enough of my wittering. John, that's been brilliant. Thanks so much. Um, well, thanks for having me. It's been awesome. I've had a, that's a, a very, very cool episode. A one hour 58 means I don't think we've... I do not think we have um, broken the record of the longest episode quite, but that's probably a good thing because... Um, yeah. The, the, the two hours is, is a lot and i've taken you away from your day job for a long time but that, that's been brilliant i've really enjoyed that technically part of my contract stipulates i'm required to do a certain amount of science communication outreach every year and covid has meant that that's low so this is great 
exactly right. This is your your Psycom stats have been boosted by Rail Natter, which is, I mean, possibly a slightly mm-hmm. complicated thing to put onto your form justifying your. But anyway, it's it's fine. It's fine. It's, it's no more complicated than going to Phoenix Comic Con or excuse me, <laughs> Phoenix Fan Diffusion. <laughs> <laughs> yep, fair point. Uh, point well taken. Yeah. Um, no, anything you want to plug? Well, I always forget this. Anything you want to plug? Um, well, I mean, so sort of if you if you would like to see more things space wise, uh, I'm on Twitter at at John M. Kristoff. Um, most of the things I put there are just sort of arguing about politics, though. So like maybe not. Uh, there's a whole bunch of good books to read about the shuttle program, uh, not just from a standpoint of the history, but also from a standpoint of like the programmatic development. Uh, the Heppenheimer ones are both good. There are several others that go into the you know the flight portion of the program itself, and they're actively launching missions. Um, and you know all of the government reports about the history of the facilities themselves are all accessible. So you know it's Library of Congress standards and NASA's history office put everything together. A lot of the material that's in there is the more detailed version of what I've been talking about here. And in fact, most of my source materials from that. So there's lots more to read. Um, briefly, also, if you uh, there's another NASA mission that's coming up soon, which I've the the mug I've been drinking tea from for this whole time has the the mission logo for the uh, mission that I work on. Yeah, we're sending a robotic spacecraft to orbit an asteroid in the asteroid belt, uh, launch in 2022, arrival in 2026, and we think it, A, is metallic in composition, and B, may be the core or the remnant part of a core of a planet that started to form and then never finished or was catastrophically disrupted in the meantime. So... Where a lot of my own expertise has been going for this uh, research has been basically trying to overlap metallurgy and materials engineering knowledge that's been developed for things like railroads with like steels and you know other you know components of engineered systems that involve iron-based metallurgy onto a planetary science and remote sensing and geology sort of paradigm of exploration. Um, as the mission gets closer, I'm going to be talking about that a little bit. And also, there's the, the mission itself at NASA Psyche has a lot of good media content, um, something to watch you know, as the years progress. At some point in the near future, I also have a gumption to do a Kerbal Space Program series, uh, basically sort of modeled off of your sort of Railways Explained and uh, you know, Permanent Way series, Gareth, on like, how do you actually do planetary science? Because Kerbal's great if you want to learn how to build a rocket or a launch vehicle. Uh, it's a little bit sort of hand wavy on the, yeah. the, the, the science the actual side. science of. collection side is a bit like box makes science in it happens. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yes. The, the, the goal for that series would basically be like, hey, there's this box called a gravioli detector. What is that? How does it do? <laughs> How do? What is a gravioli? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, yeah, I look forward to that. I, I shall, um, I sh- I, at the point at which you have enough time to put it together, I look forward to, um, to watching. That'll be good. Um, maybe someday I'll go back to Kerbal Space Program in, in my series as well. But it definitely will be. I don't know. We're, we're utterly preoccupied building an unbelievably complicated, massive railway at the moment. So that'll be uh, in the distant future. We're preoccupied with a not even all that complicated by NASA standards, but still pretty complicated <laughs> mission. Yeah. Yeah, like that's, that's four years of flight time to arrival as well. That's mm-hmm. like, it's a, wow, very cool. Um, right, we must, we broke, it's two hours and two minutes. There's a risk that we're getting to, to that we're going to be winning something to do with this soon if we don't stop. So, John, that's been brilliant. Thank you so much. Everyone, thanks so much for watching. Those of you who are still here, we've, we've, we've lost a few of you have gone, oh, it's time. I, I God, I've got to go and have some food. Yeah, you do. Go, that's fine. Everyone, thank you so much. Our international viewers, thank you so much. Uh, that's been Rail Natter, and we'll see you next week. Cheerio!